Can't well. ignore him. You cannot ignore him. This is not a blip. This is not, you know, people going mad in 2016. This is a phenomenon. There, he is a constituency. Mm. We need to talk about it and take him seriously. Love him, loathe him, think he's an idiot, whatever you want. There is a discussion to be had, and I think he's going to be the next I president. I was going to say, and you're probably going to be calling I, him I president think, again I soon. I also think he's going to be president as well. Peter, I hope you have a great show. I hope it goes very well indeed. Dr. Rennie, thank you very much thank indeed. You. Are you coming in See, tomorrow? I will come in tomorrow. That's <laughs> terribly nice of you. Right, uh, thank you very much indeed for your company this morning. We're back tomorrow. Uh, kick off from seven o'clock in the morning. Hope to see you there. This This is Talk TV. Three, two, one. Uh, go Browns. This, my friends, is Talk Today with me, Jeremy Kyle. And me, Nicola Thorpe. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. A woman can become a man and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. Slick Rishi seemed intelligent, forensic, even a bit of a statesman, the type of man you'd trust to look after your house while you went on holiday. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. Happy Thursday. Um, uh, we slick it, cool and timorous beastie. Open a panic in thy beastie. Keir Starmer has accused the government of failing a generation after a record number of young people were killed last year using a knife or sharp object. We need to make sure that when we say we're going to ban them, we actually do ban them. There are so many politicians now who just said, my dad was a boss. Right? <laughs> yeah. like, like, You're David Cameron. No, he wasn't. <laughs> Like brought to you by Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London. Very rarely meet anybody that says, you know, the thing about London is it's got a great mayor, <laughs> Sadiq Khan, brilliant guy. In the cities, there are areas where there are no vegetables. It's particularly difficult for those people to do what Mark is saying. If he comes up with this argument again, I'll sit on it. <laughs> <laughs> all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? If you're talking about multiculturalism, it's working class white boys who get put in the army. The poorest people in society are the ones who are going to be put on the front line. Something is going horribly wrong. We can do a lot better. Donald Trump didn't just win. He obliterated. This is a guy facing nearly 100 criminal charges, and yet all that's done is actually make him more popular. Trump is canny enough to know that all publicity is good publicity. I don't want a president who's been impeached. If he's able to bamboozle you, or that's the way it comes. I did my six months, I came back, nobody would touch me. I put my head down, I persisted, I carried on. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. I've asked you two questions. Should a mass stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. Just when I was getting used to my show, What Just Happened, being on Talk TV every Friday night at 10.30, they go and change it. I'm furious. They've moved it to 8.30 every Friday. Talk TV. What just happened? I am furious. A very good morning to you. This is Talk TV. I'm Peter Cardwell. An absolute pleasure to be with you between now and one o'clock. We'll be talking about all sorts of things today. And I want your thoughts as well. The number, of course, 0344 
499-1000. We'll be talking about Keir's war on jobs. Keir Starmer unveiled a war on jobs blueprint yesterday as he urged parents to get a grip on disruptive children. We'll be talking to the journalist who spoke to him, Ryan Saby, the deputy political editor of The Sun. We'll be looking at some of the footage of what Sir Keir had to say. We want your reaction as well, 0344 499 1000. Lots of things are being missed by other parts of the media and we're going to talk about them today including the fact that uh, in Israel there are, there are there's a global silence regarding Hamas's sexual abuse of Israeli women. There's an activist in the UK called Nimco Ali. She's CEO of the Five Foundation, an incredible campaigner. We're going to talk to her about that. Why has it been missed? Why are people not talking about it? We'll talk about the International Court of Justice as well, saying Israel needs to stop genocide. So far, so predictable. We'll have a big debate with Charlie Downs and indeed with Matthew Laza. We're talking about the Nottingham mother calling for an inquiry into those horrific killings the US moving nuclear weapons back to the UK. What do you think about that? Trump storming out of the courtroom after being ordered to pay $83.3 million in a defamation case. And we'll be talking later on as well about, uh, about the fact that Rishi Sunak has condemned the what he calls the horrific irony of the Israeli genocide ruling. And our colleague Evan Gershowitz has had his appeal rejected. He is still illegally, in my view, detained by Russia. Absolutely horrendous what's happening there. Thanks to everybody who's been in touch already. You can get in touch throughout the show. 0344 499 1000. Text me 87222 with the word talk in your text. And you can tweet me at Talk TV or follow me at Peter Cardwell. Thank you to uh, thank you to Christine in Surrey. It says morning, Peter. If Harry and Meghan, something else we're talking about this morning. If Harry and Meghan dislike the royal family so much, why on earth do they drop the titles? They absolutely do not deserve. Says Christine. Uh, Dan says morning, Cardi P. There's only one end game when nuclear powers go to war. They know we're definitely not prepared for. It. But who knows? China and Russia could have been building underground bunkers in the last 20 years. On the bright side, it's Saturday. Looking forward to the show. I am too, Dan. Let's get started here on Talk TV. Thank you also to Wayne in Nottinghamshire reacting to what I was talking to uh, Renee and David about it, the makeup lady who said I was, uh, I was uh, handsome. Uh, she says, morning, Peter. Did the makeup artist say you're so handsome after she put your face on? If so, she was just complimenting her work. <laughs> there we are. Uh, thanks also to this anonymous texture who says, sorry, I find Peter dull and boring. Just saying, more Kevin and Alex. I'm all for more Kevin and Alex, but I don't find myself dull and boring. But then again, I don't have to listen to myself. I want to say a big hello to Brian from Dulwich. I got in a black cab in London this week, and a rare treat. And he was a wonderful driver who gave me his views on all sorts of things. And he's a big fan of Talk TV. So I want to say hello to Brian from Dulwich who is a loyal listener to a uh, listens to it on in his cab as he goes along so thank you to him for getting me safely to my destination now then uh, parents must step up to stop their kids blighting neighborhoods with anti-social behavior those are the words of Keir Starmer I think we probably all agree with that sentiment but how is it on earth is he going to do it I spoke to Yvette Cooper the uh, shadow home secretary this week we'll be playing that whole interview tomorrow in case you missed it and we'll be talking about it a little bit later on with our resident policing expert and crime expert uh, Peter Black say a little bit later on but first I want to talk to Ryan Saby who is the deputy political editor of The Sun talk to him in a sec but first of all let's have a look at what Sir Keir Starmer told Ryan in this exclusive interview with The Sun. The word they used in the cap with me is respect um, they want to see respect from the people that are causing the antisocial behaviour they want to be respected the individuals who live here and, and the, the way to give them that respect is to allow them to directly input into the payback and boards to say what we want is the wall you've just graffitied the window you've just broken you're going to be part of paying this back you have to have the teeth with the police you have to have this lead it needs a it needs a law enforcement lead linked to the local community that czar person that person with a dedication um, to say we're going to crack this and make a real difference to the lives of people. What often happens is this is a sort of gateway onto more serious offending, but it also is um, a, the creation, if you don't do this, of a sense of the place falling apart, that people don't feel safe coming out. If you have graffiti, if you have harassment, um, then people feel that their, their community where they live um, is, is being you know, pulled away from them. And, People have massive pride in the place that they live, and um, that is why, I mean, very often when I was um, chief prosecutor for five years, people used to say to me, Keir, antisocial behaviour is low level, you know, 
it's the higher stuff that's more important. Yeah, of course the higher stuff is important, but antisocial behaviour has a massive impact on people. Um, and so sort of tattooed through our programme for this is the word respect. Yeah. Um, respect for your community, respect for your neighbours, the people who lived here, um, and instilling a sense of respect in the people that are causing antisocial behaviour. There's a very strong feeling I in the cafe that, it, that, that in the last... I don't know, decade or so, we've lost that sense of respect in our communities and I'm absolutely determined that we're going to turn this around. Parents have a huge role, schools have a role, um, the support services have a role because um, we need to intervene and stop this happening in the first place where we can. So we've got to operate at both ends. Yes, everything we can through parents and others to prevent this in the first place. The other end, you've got to have teeth in the enforcement. One of the schemes that they are beginning to do around here is have police officers go into the primary schools yeah. um, to talk to children before they get to secondary school, um, working with school staff, working with parents to try to get that sense of respect before kids go off the rails. Local businesses are blighted by antisocial behaviour. If there's graffiti, if there's broken windows, then your business can't thrive. If people around the area feel they don't want to come out because they don't feel safe, then they're not going to be using local businesses. So this is about the local economy as well. So it's for communities and for businesses. The least that should happen for these communities is for them to see those that are causing the problem actually having the respect to go and fix the problem. And I think that will make a massive difference to people who live in the area. Also, if those that are putting graffiti on the walls are the ones that are having to spend their time cleaning it up, yeah. I think they might be a bit slower to put it back on there the next week no. to have to go and clear it up again. Well, not so Sir Softy would appear to be what Sir Keir Starmer wants us all to believe anyway. Lots there in terms of parents, in terms of policing, uh, teachers as well being involved in uh, getting rid of anti-social behaviour. These yobs who just make a life an absolute misery for so many people, whether it's graffitiing things, whether it's shouting at people, whether it's um, hanging around in street corners making a nuisance of themselves. It's a really, really annoying thing. I see it all the time near where I live, and it really does. I mean, I have pride in where I live, and I'm sure you do too, but you want to have more pride because you want to make sure that you uh, can be safe where you live. And I know there's a lot of people who don't feel safe. Let us know what you think of what Sir Keir Starmer was saying there. 0344 499 1000. The man who was talking to him is Ryan Saby, and Ryan is the Deputy Political Editor of The Sun. You can read his interview. It's on uh, page two, I think. Yes, page two of The Sun today, Keir's War on Yobs. It says, let's talk to Ryan now. Ryan, you're very welcome, and thank you for speaking to us on a Saturday, which I know is usually your day off. Uh, what did you make of what Sir Keir said? Some pretty strong messages in there. Yeah, there was, and it was, it was interesting that he decided to spend um, a decent chunk of this week um, focusing on crime. On Thursday, he was talking about knife crime and new measures that um, he would like to introduce if he gets into number 10 um, to, to sort of reduce the, uh, the, the the availability of those knives and, uh, and the crackdowns on on availability and also um, also make it more and more difficult or outlaw um, getting hold of zombie knives. And then he spent Friday talking about antisocial behaviour, um, which really does blight neighbourhoods uh, up and down the country. Uh, and one of the most telling things I thought was when we went into a cafe yesterday where Sir Keir met um, local residents, and, and it really kind of brought home just how difficult it is for some people on some estates. They were talking about issues of fly tipping, um, uh, sort, of, sort of violent behaviour, um, stabbings that they'd had on their doorstep. And people just don't want to leave their leave their front doors if they feel like they feel so so anxious uh, about getting out. So, and also he wants to talk about the punishments, how that would come into it, and any any kind of policy in the future. It's who's going to pay for this, Ryan? Because a lot of what he's talking about is our groups working together. And so when I actually interviewed about Cooper this week, the Shadow Home Secretary, we're going to be talking about that a little bit later. And there is this question of you know if they want to put more police on the streets, if they want to have a greater crackdown on antisocial behaviour, if they want to give uh, even giving local communities more powers re will require some sort of support structure. Uh, you presumably ask them about where the cash is coming from. Yeah, in fact, that had already been answered, actually. The, the, so the cash had, is actually going to come, in terms of the policing, is actually going to come from sort of efficiency savings within the police force. So, so those efficiency savings themselves would pay for 
um, those police, 13,000 neighborhood police officers to go out um, on, on the streets and uh, and target what we would call hotspots, those sort of areas where um, communities are expecting... Uh, many many uh, people uh, would argue, Ryan, that that should have been happening already, certainly in terms of law and order. Labour are ahead of the Conservatives in polls and so on, so and quite a, quite a few polls. I wonder what our viewers and listeners think. 0344 499 1000. I just want to read you some of the reaction that they've had, Ryan, and I'll, I'll, I'll come back to you for your reaction to that. Jenny says, another word salad and no policy. Well, Jenny, I think there is policy there. There are, there are ideas, certainly. Uh, the government took away the right of parents to discipline their own kids, says Karen. They don't like the results. Um, Starmer says, Leslie, he knew he was head of the Department of Public Prosecution. He never fails to tell us why have Labour constantly voted against stop and search. Will says, the first thing I've heard where I agree with Starmer, make jobs help, put things right, be tough with people, they'll stop doing it. I also include Just Stop Oil and make them clean paint and chemicals of the buildings they damage. Why should we pay for it? I think, I, I mean, leaving Just Stop Oil to one side, although I completely agree with what Will says, that wasn't what Keir Starmer was talking about. This idea of getting jobs to actually clean things up, to physically do, undo the damage they've done, Ryan, that's going to be a popular policy. Yeah, totally. It's very similar to something the government um, are, are, are looking at. Um, I know they launched a big antisocial behaviour drive um, a few months ago. But one thing that Keir Starmer was very, very keen um, to press was that the, the people in the local community, they will decide what the punishments will be. Now, we're not talking about really sort of high level prison sentences or, you know, suspended sentences or uh, that level. But what we are talking about is, you know, cleaning up graffiti, um, painting, redecorating, renovating community centres, doing all that all that sort of work on the ground that um, those people themselves have, uh, have, have helped destroy. And one thing that was, was quite telling when we were out with uh, Keir Starmer yesterday is that they were actually cleaning uh, an underpass. It had been graffitied and uh, they were painting it. And the, the group of um, council workers were saying they go from site to site to site every couple of weeks. And it's the same people over and over again mm -hmm, who are doing mm -hmm, this graffiti. Mm -hmm. And if they were the ones who are actually cleaning it up, they'd think twice about doing it. So putting the uh, the punishments back into the hands of the uh, local community is where Keir Starmer sees um, this going um, for this low-level crime. And then before um, these sort of petty criminals, as it were, then go on to something more serious. So that's where he sees uh, sees this policy going. What did you make of his, Keir Starmer's kind of demeanour and attitude, uh, Ryan? Is he someone who sort of, do you think he feels confident he'll be the next Prime Minister? Has he got that kind of steely determination in his eyes? Yeah, I think I think if you speak to anyone in and around Labour, you, you, you speak to Keir Starmer, the, the one word they will always come back with is uh, uh, let, let's, you know, complacency. They, they, they're yeah. not going to afford to be uh, complacent any step of the way. But I think there is a quiet, confidence amongst uh, anyone in the Labour Party. You're 20, 25 points ahead in the polls. Uh, thing, you know, Things are looking good. It's very, very difficult for uh, the government, especially when you have uh, the psychodrama playing out. You have ex-Cabinet Minister Simon Clark this week saying uh, the country is facing, you know, the Tory party is facing a massacre um, if they don't change uh, the Prime Minister. So R Rishi Sunak will be trying to get on the front foot, but every time he tries to um, to sort of, you know, steal a march. He has his own side picking holes in him every every time. Ryan, thank you very much indeed. That's Ryan Sabie there. He's deputy political editor of The Sun. You can read his whole interview with Keir Starmer either online on The Sun Online or in the paper today. It's on page two there about Sir Keir Starmer's war on jobs. What do you think about this? Let me know, 0344 499 1000. Sue's been in touch on Twitter. She's, she says, children need to be taught respect from the early years at home. Bad parenting is endemic. Kids having kids of their own when they had poor parenting themselves is the cycle. Parents are not supposed to be friends with their children. Love them, but teach respect. That's absolutely what my parents did. They certainly were not my best friends, uh, although they kind of are now. Carol said, well, history is repeating itself. Starmer is actually saying about Bobbies on the Beat and local police houses and neighbourhoods. Why now? We've said this for years. They just don't listen. Uh, thank you to Edward, who's been in touch as well. Cardi P, the beautiful, gentle England I grew up in is long gone. We feel unsafe in our cities. We have institutions that hate our Indigenous people. Our history is being denigrated. Would I fight for this country again? No, I do not trust them to have any respect for us tax-paying plebs. As for Starmer, that's a laugh. His ilk has caused 
all this disharmony. Well, there are definitely people who uh, Starmer has perhaps struck a little bit of a chord with, but others who are just not impressed at all. Mick says Starmer talks the talk, but history reveals he does not walk the walk uh, on policing. He's trying to reinvent the home beat officers in the 70s. He is correct, but will he do it? Well, he says he'll do it, I suppose. That's all we have at the moment. Anyway, Wayne says, uh, Kier makes John Major seem downright emotive. I fell asleep at least six times during a dull speech. That was actually a conversation. It wasn't even a speech. Um, fine, uh, the pa fine the parents of the, these youths for lack of control. A financial penalty on the family, says Mick. Uh, continually causing trouble is one way of getting them to take action. That's Mick in Bradford there. Uh, Nicky in Slough says, this is already done. It's called community payback. My area has been doing it for years. Always problems, though. No one to supervise. No toilets. The latter was always a problem for us, as they can't do out side work without toilets apparently there we are well I, I mean I was a journalist too. well I am a journalist I work outside all the time not knowing the toilets you've got to nip into a cafe or uh, or whatever I've, I've knocked people's doors and asked them to go to the loo anyway probably too much information Lynn is in Yorkshire 0344 499 1000 is the number she has called Lynn um, thanks for giving us a call this morning you're very welcome to the programme what do you make of this are you convinced by Sir Keir well, I'm not into politics and I'm not into politicians and um, I'm just so cross and angry about the jobs that you're talking about and these people who just absolutely have no respect for, for anybody or anything. What have you seen, so, Lynn? What have you experienced? Well, I'm fortunate. I live in a very good area and I'm very grateful for that. And But now I'm retired. But all the things I see on the, on the news and with you um, and I just feel now the courts here... They're absolutely, they're as much use as a chocolate fire guard as the courts. And I think now we need to bring back national service. And that's not just for boys, that's also for girls. So if you don't have a job when you're leaving school, you need now national service. And that's what we need. Do you think national service would work in the current circumstances, Lynn? Because I talk to military people who say, actually, we want the people who want to be there, but we don't want the people who don't want to be there. So where do they go? The prisons are full. Our prisons are absolutely full. The courts absolutely don't do what they should do by giving the right sentencing. So, you know, this country now is on its knees. The whole of the country is on its knees. And I feel so strongly about this. This is why it's lovely to talk to you this morning, because I very rarely do this. But I feel so strongly. And parents do need to to play a big role. Yes, well, you well, are. Well, first of all, Lynn, thanks for giving us a call. I'm glad you're, you're, I have an opportunity to vent your frustration. I mean, tell us what you think should happen. You say you're not political, so I'm not going to ask you, you know, is it Keir or Rishi or whatever for you. What if, if you were in control or you could advise or give a message to those who are in control, what would you say? What do you think the solution to this is, Lynn? Well, I don't know about the solution, but we need to be tougher. We need to be so much tougher now with people who just break the law, who get away with it, and the courts the courts need to stand up as well. They need to have more balls yeah. in the courts. I talked to Yvette Cooper this week, the Shadow Home Secretary, Lynn, and I asked her about shoplifting. Now, shoplifting, it, it's, it, look, it, it's, it's a horrible thing for retailers. There are, I know there are a lot of people who have this on in the shop today, uh, maybe on the radio or the telly in the corner, and uh, they are basically shoplifting in this country has been decriminalised. If it's under £200, police aren't interested. There are gangs that come in, they take loads of stuff off the shelves, and they do it maybe two or three times in one day. That's happened as well. And there's so many hard-working shopkeepers, so many people who just want to go into a shop and buy something, just go about their daily business, and there are shoplifters there. I mean, it just seems even these low-level crimes, I mean, people say low-level. It doesn't feel low-level if you're affected by it. It doesn't feel low-level if you're a retailer. It doesn't feel low-level if you're in the shop and someone comes and grab some stuff. It's a horrible, horrible thing. But a lot of this low-level stuff, or what we call low-level crimes, like graffiti, like antisocial behaviour, as you say, Lynn, there's just so much of it that seems to be sort of swept under the carpet, oh, it's in the too difficult box. Well, yes, I worked in retail for 15 years, and I retired. I just retired last year. So I saw... I you know all about it, then? Supermarkets. Yeah, I worked for one of the big supermarkets. So, yes, that used to infuriate me as well. People seem as though it's their God-given right to whether it's whether it's drink or whatever and it's tagged and it's this this is not food this is not baby food or this is not food this is expensive things yeah this is you know so what would happen in the i'm not going to ask you the name of the supermarket or anything lynn but what what, what <laughs> no, would happen no, if it's, it's a big one it's a big one okay so what 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 happened what happened when someone well you you were working away and you saw someone perhaps lifting something or putting on another jacket what would happen at that point lynn well, no, they just get away with it. You can't, you can't touch them until they walk out of the store. Unfortunately, mm. I've chased after someone before. I've done that myself. What happened then? Uh, because, <laughs> well, 
Well, lucky, well, lucky enough, the security guard absolutely was ex-police, and he recognised on the camera because he'd come on on the afternoon, and this had happened on the morning, and I chased this guy out, which I shouldn't have done. But I just feel so. And you felt it was the right thing to do. Of course, it wasn't. No, and I shouldn't have done it. But um, but, but to <laughs> me, it sounds like the right thing to do, chasing him out and saying, "Hold on a second, mate, that's not yours." Yeah, but he was a lot younger than me. He was a lot faster. Okay. Okay. <laughs> But yeah, I wouldn't advise anybody to do it, but it just makes me furious. It's, it's, they feel, as I say, God-given right to help yeah. themselves. And it's not. When people are working hard, especially nowadays with things being as so hard as they are, it's just not their right to just help themselves. So, yes, that's another, that's another grey area, I think. Yeah, OK. Well, Lynn, listen, thank you very, very much indeed. I really appreciate that. And very, very interesting to hear from Lynn, who, wor who worked uh, for a major supermarket. I just want to tell you one more thing, actually, uh, which is from a friend of mine who works in a shop as well. And uh, talking about this isn't so much antisocial criminal behaviour, but certainly antisocial behaviour. Uh, she messaged me this yesterday. I'm sure she won't mind me telling you this. Um, a horrible woman came into a shop with a huge buggy, a free-range child, I love that phrase, and broke some stuff. As I was clearing up, the glass from a huge candle knocked over. She neither acknowledged me nor said sorry. She rammed her huge buggy into my ankle as I was clearing up the broken glass. She still hadn't said hello or even sorry for breaking the glass. I said that I was afraid breakages would need to be paid for, £20 for this half-price candle. The woman said, can't you just take care of it? She had a dismissive look. She hadn't even said hello. I asked whether she meant the small, clearly independent shop should pay for it or me personally on £10.50 an hour. She said, your career choices are not my problem. Her child was still running amok. I said, my career choices are no more to comment upon than I would about how your child behaves in public. It's still £20, please, for the broken item. She paid. And then a woman came up to my friend afterwards and said, well done. I think she did very well in that. We're going to talk uh, about all sorts of things, including Sir Keir Starmer. In just a minute, we'll take more of your calls as well. Give us a call like Lynn did, 0344 499 1000. They wouldn't let me in. Um, Why not? I, if you don't mind me telling, is there yeah, a... No, it was, it, was, uh, it was medical reasons, which right, I personally right. thought were a little bit, I don't know, a little bit unfair. <laughs> okay, it was a little okay. bit arbitrary, a little bit box ticky. Um, okay. But the point was, I mean, I wanted to join it for, in fact, the very reason that your, um, that your caller just said, which was the sort of the discipline, the lifestyle that it allows you to cultivate, the kind of personal pursuit of excellence. Um, and obviously we've got Boris Johnson talking about conscription, um, which is a very interesting idea. Now... Uh, I'm, I'm in, in principle, I'm actually in favour of conscription. But when I, I talk think... to people in the army, Charlie, mm. what happens is they say, look, we want the people who want mm. to be there. We don't want the people who don't want to be there. We don't want to be babysitters yeah. for people who don't want to be there and, and aren't committed, as you clearly mm. were, to a life of service and, you yeah. know, pushing yourself and physicality and all the rest mm. of it. Well, it's tricky because we do, I mean, we live in a very, a tremendously undisciplined time. I mean, especially, uh, you know, people my kind of age, my sort of generation. Um, you How know, old there's are you? No, I'm 22. Okay. Um, there's no, there's no um, recognition of the value of standards, discipline, propriety, um, hold, you know, holding yourself to account, all this sort of thing. Um, and the army does allow you, I mean, the army forces you to be that way. Um, and so I think to an extent, f you know, forcing people to uh, go through the training and live that kind of lifestyle for a sort of set period of time, mm. I don't think it could be the worst thing in the world. Granted, you know, as, uh, as you just said, there will be people in the army who think, well, these people don't really even want to be here. They didn't come here by choice. Mm -hmm. So there could be issues with that. Uh, but I think that generally speaking, you know, it's not a terrible idea. That being said, the kind of conscription that Boris Johnson is talking about, I am absolutely opposed to. Because I don't think that we should be sending, you know, British boys and girls, you know, around my kind of age to die in foreign wars that don't really impact us at all. That is a big question in terms of whether we're overcommitted. Let's get that to that in a minute. I just want to ask Matthew Laza, first of all, would you sign up for a king and country? Oh, well, I think I'm a little bit too old. Sadly, I don't think they'd have me um, on age grounds, if, if, if not on any other. I think the uh, Chinese and the Russians would be rubbing their hands with glee if I signed up oh, for military Oh, well, you and me both, like, Peter. Here's a fat, useless guy who can't pick up a, who can't pick up a gun, um, who can't run the length of himself, um, who will yeah. be useless at this. So Ex I, well, I, you I, and want, me both. I want people who are good at it and want to do yeah, it to do absolutely. it. absolutely. I mean, look, so the, my Social Democrat friends in Sweden Sweden, when they were in power, we introduced a, a, a form of conscription, which has just come into effect. And of course, one of the particular issues there is 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 having uh, you know a long border uh, and coast that you know with is Russia. Not too, with Russia, exactly. So if you need a lot of people to to guard border posts, uh, then conscripts are quite good at that. What conscripts tend not to be brilliant at is uh, is hardcore fighting and the yeah. sort of operations that the British military's uh, been involved with, which is more which is obviously more skilled uh, rather than uh, people who've only had I, a basic training, which is what conscripts. What about the idea? Get. I want to talk about anti-social behaviour. Second, but what about the idea 
of um, you know some form of national service mm. that's not necessarily military service. A citizen service, maybe yeah. A citizen mm. service, maybe helping out, maybe helping in care homes, for example, would be something. We've got, we've got a lot of, lot of vacancies there at the moment. Uh, what about um, doing other forms of voluntary activity, teaching people who have a real stake in society? A couple of years ago, was that something you would have done, Charlie? Yeah, I, I think so, absolutely. Um, I mean, I think any kind of... The, the problem is, we live under a regime currently that's just, that just doesn't have the best interests of the British people at heart. If we lived under a pro-Britain, you know, pro-British people regime, then I think that national service, whether that be you know, sort of civic, as you were talking about, or military, would be a good thing. Um, but the fact is, you know, we kind of, we don't have that kind of government. We have a government that just seems only interested in serving the interests of foreign powers and behaving in a way that's entirely antithetical to the interests of the British people. Well, the next government may well be under Sir Keir Starmer. His home secretary may well be Yvette Cooper. I spoke to her this week about knife crime. We've been talking about antisocial behaviour as well. Uh, we're talking about Ryan Seabee's interview with Yvette Cooper. I just want to play you a little bit now of what Yvette Cooper told me earlier this week about knife crime, and then I want to ask my guests about it. I want to ask you as well, 0344 499 1000. Let's hear from Yvette Cooper, the Shadow Home Secretary. The question many are asking is, with the government moving on knife crime, it's introduced new legislation today, why is that not enough? What would you do that's further and faster? I think the Conservative government is going nowhere near far enough. Obviously, there have been long delays. I think that we've had about 17 different announcements. They were going to ban zombie knives. They're still on the streets. But they also need to go much further. This ban doesn't include the sort of ninja swords, the kind of real dangerous weapons that have been used in really terrible, fatal stabbings. And also, I don't think they're doing enough to tackle some of the online illegal sales where we think there should be stronger criminal penalties as well. In terms of that, isn't it just the case that the people who are selling these knives and actually making these knives, don't they just innovate to get beyond the law? Is there any way to really catch up with them? That is a risk and that's why you have to both move fast and you have to be much broader in the scope of this ban because otherwise if you just have a set a little measurement here or a change there then they'll just adapt what it is they're making and selling and making profits from and that's why we need a, a much broader ban to take these dangerous weapons off the street but also we want to do a full review of what's happening in terms of age identification some of those checks which again are just not happening it's making it far too easy for young people to get hold of dangerous weapons and to have them on the streets we've got to get them off the streets we're in Milton Keynes today and you're mm. doing a sort of three-day blitz talking about this what have you learned in Milton Keynes today well, we've been talking to local police officers, to the chief constable, to local community organisations here. They've done a lot of work here and I came here some time ago because they were having real problems with knife crime. They've done a lot of work here to try and tackle that and to work together. And so we were hearing about the things that they found that made a difference are the things we're calling for nationally. Really early, fast intervention. Making sure that you've got the youth workers that are ready to step in in a and &E units they can move fast or in custody suites to be able to get straight on with the action that is needed to get young people back on track to prevent them re-offending we've got to have much stronger action so you don't have young people just falling through the net and a major new prevention program the young futures program that we want to roll out right across the country that was Yvette Cooper talking to me, and uh, that was on Thursday. And earlier, we heard a little bit from Keir Starmer, who was interviewed by Ryan Seaby. He's the deputy political editor of The Sun. Lots of people getting in touch. Susan says, anti-social behaviour and lack of respect has always been a huge problem in this country due to our soft touch, not just among young kids, but adults as well. Police on the streets, notably absent. Jill, Jim in Chelmsford says, yes, bring back conscription. It gives young people values. Then watch the boats stop and these people leave the UK if they have to fight for the freedoms and benefits they want. We had to fight for them, but not just hold our hands out, says Jim. Natasha says, morning, Peter. It's interesting that you say the military only want people who want to join rather than national service. However, that's the problem. Those that want to join are ignored in favour of diversity. 
John in Burnham on Sea says, Good morning, Peter. Keir Starmer and politicians of all parties have been telling us how their policies will reduce and punish antisocial behaviour for as long as I can remember. Nothing ever changes. It's just sound bites to get elected. I definitely heard a, a bit of a sigh from uh, Charlie Downs at one point when uh, Yvette Cooper was speaking. Explain the motivation behind your sigh. <laughs> well, all, all, I, all I heard when she was speaking there is the sort of tough on crime, tough on the causes of crime. We've heard it before. That we've heard before. And, you know, the reason that, you know, in, in theory, crime went down under New Labour. But the only reason that that happened is because they changed the way that crime was recorded to be far less uh, accurate, frankly. Um, I don't think that the Labour Party, or for that matter, basically any sitting politician in this country actually has the stones to deal with the crime problem that is you know that is rapidly growing in this country particularly in london yeah it's terrible what's happening in london metropolitan police are a joke um but i i think that the best form i think the kind of progressive view of justice where rehabilitation is the appropriate response to something like a knife crime epidemic has been shown to be a complete and utter failure i think the best form of rehabilitation is punishment i think that we are as as one of your uh, one of the texts said you know, we are a soft touch. Now, this person said that we've always been that way, but the fact is we haven't always been that way. There was a time where Britain was famous for its, uh, you know, for its uh, justice system. You know, the way that we punished people, the, you know, the absolute iron fist that we ruled with, um, which is a good thing. If you want a functioning nation, that's what you need. Matthew, presumably you were a bit more impressed with what uh, yeah. Cooper and Keir Starmer have been saying. Absolutely. I think, first of all, it's good to see them making it a priority uh, because it clearly hasn't been a priority uh, for the government, which is why uh, we've seen the growth in knife crime uh, that we have. Uh, and look, I think um, Yvette was uh, absolutely uh, on the right lines. You need to... Um, it's not so much rehabilitation of people when they've committed a crime. It's, ensure, it's trying to, as she said there, to trying to prevent the growth in knife crime. One of the scandalous things we've seen in the uh, so-called austerity years uh, uh, of this government is the absolute decimation of youth work uh, around the country, which is so important, totally unglamorous. Um, uh, but, you know, people... But simply having a youth worker is not going to stop someone being antisocial. No. It'll stop some people, but it won't stop them uh, all. Of course and, I mean, there is this kind of, why don't we just have more youth clubs kind of idea. I mean, the people who are perpetrating well, all this social behaviour, don't go, go to youth yeah, clubs no, 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 youth workers, to. yeah, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a misnomer to say youth work equals youth clubs. Which no, is no, I'm not idea. saying it does. Because often, because we're talking about people with specific skills, people who are, are often the youth workers involved are people who themselves grew up in these communities uh, which have particular knife crime problems. Um, um, a lot of them were in gangs themselves and they say, so, you know, this is not sort of the sort of image of, you know, a trendy vicar going along and putting out a ping pong table. Um, it's actually all kind of detailed work and, this, and actually in Glasgow, which has ha obviously has uh, long uh, had a knife crime problem, Treating knife crime as a public health issue has had real um, uh, has a real impact. Well, you think Glasgow is, is an exemplar of what should be it's done? Had, it's really? Had, it's, uh, over the last few years, Glasgow has, has, has had a, a specific strategy to treat it as a, uh, as a public health issue, and it has seen for the first time in a long time, because as you say, historically Glasgow has had very uh, high, uh, high knife crime levels, actually made a difference. So there are things that you can do. It is, it is, we should not wring our hands in despair. There are things that can be done, and they've not been done. And one of those, as Yvette said, is the is, is extremely extending the weapons ban. Helen Hayes, uh, Labour uh, MP, has put forward uh, legislation this week. Hopefully that will go on across party support to, to, to sort the zombie knives ban out because that's the f first step. Thanks to Stephen nodding, I'm sure he said, if we did have conscription, it did happen to go to war, what would happen with all the illegal immigrants left in this country, especially the ones who uh, could be from countries we are at war with? Sharon says that Charlie speaks a lot of sense. What a breath of fresh air he is, uh, says Sharon. That's a nice thing to say. Julia says, Peter, you're my favourite. Thank you, Julia. Uh, we live in sad times these days. The youth of today have no respect for anyone or anything. Heaven only knows what we'll do in the event of a war. It'll be left to pensioners to fight for our country. Uh, goodness me, I hope not. They've uh, served this country long enough. Uh, Jennifer Jennifer is in, uh, a, 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 in in a good way. I mean, uh, Jennifer has been in touch. Oh three four 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 nine nine one thousand. Jennifer, what would you like to say to me and indeed to the panel? Matthew and Charlie are here. Thanks for your call. Um, good morning. And um, what I'd like to say is, um, I think it's wrong to call these uh, shoplifting and that sort of thing low level yeah. crime because. Um, if the, 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 the people who are the perpetrators, you know, then go on to bigger things. I think if you tackle, tackle the low-level crime very hard, then they may not go on to, um, you know, think they can get away with it and go on to other things. And also, it's not low-level to the people it's happening to. You're, you're absolutely I, right. You're absolutely you know, right. I mean, if, it, if we... Sorry. No, go ahead, Jennifer. Yeah, if we, if we, I've always said, you know, if you find someone a thousand pound for parking on a double yellow line, they wouldn't do it again. That's <laughs> true. Um, but, and the, the thing is, if um, with graffiti and things like that, and like even Extinction Rebellion, if they were made to clear up 
all the paint that they put on bedaub places with, they would probably think twice before doing it because it's blooming hard work clearing these things up. The same with graffiti. I think we should target the parents more um, and make them more responsible. Yeah. And if all these things don't work, then we should have boot camps. And I think one of the worst things that's happened in this country is raising the school leaving age to 18 um, because if they don't, uh, people, not everyone wants to go to university and if they don't get jobs, they just become feral and they find the easiest way of life is just to um, wheel and deal, you know, steal and all that sort of thing. And I just think, you know, we've lost control because we don't come down hard to start with. We need to okay. be very, very um, uh, disciplined in this country with, uh, and I say it starts with the parents, really, yeah. or parents, if there's not two parents. And if, if the children, in a way, they're not respecting their parent when they go out to do these well, things. Well, it's very true. They're not, 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 not respecting anybody, not respecting you and me. Jennifer, no, stay, but, stay where you are just for a second. Yeah. I want to get the reaction from my yeah. panel, and then I promise I'll come back to you for a final word okay. before we go to the break, OK? Charlie, you were yeah. nodding your head through a lot of that. Before you were born, I think, uh, Rudy Giuliani, when he was mayor of New York, had this sort of broken window mm. theory that if, you, if someone does something as low-level shall we say, or the phrase of the morning, um, to breaking a window, they should be, you know, absolutely come down hard on because that'll stop them doing things, much worse things. Do you think that's a good approach, very, very tough yeah. approach that Jennifer is advocating? I absolutely agree with that. I mean, that's kind of what I was saying before. I think that punishment is the best form of rehabilitation. It's also the best form of prevention. You know, people should fear the law. Criminals should fear the law. They should fear the police. Um, and I think that what Jennifer was saying about universities and school was absolutely spot on as well. I've, I've long thought that, you know, again, we're back to Blair, him saying 50% of people need to go through university. I think it's a terrible Nonsense. idea. For Absolutely a few reasons nonsense. as well. First reason is that you know makes the value it makes a degree valueless. Okay, I've just, yeah, I've just finished studies. Yeah, I've just finished university <laughs> myself, and uh, and I, you know it feels to me like my degree is you know sure it might get my foot in the door, but it doesn't have that value and prestige that. Well, it used people to have. feel they need a master's degree now. There yeah. are loads of places where you didn't need a degree mm. beforehand. You now need a degree. That's a bit of a side issue, but on this issue of uh, anti-social behaviour that Jennifer was talking about on a tough approach. That, I mean, Labour is at least talking about mm. it, Matthew Laza. The question is whether they'll deliver because we've had the we've had the uh, Conservatives under pressure, having talked about, for example, banning zombie knives many, many times. They're finally going to get round to it in September. What do you think of what Jennifer was saying, Matthew? Well, I think Jennifer's absolutely right. The, the phrase low-level crime is a, is a ghastly one and shouldn't be used because every crime matters uh, to either of its crime against the person or against the community in which it takes place if it's something like graffiti. So Labour put a huge emphasis when it was in power and anti social behaviour. It was uh, at the top of the Blair agenda. It said some things that worked and some things that didn't work. It, um, and one of the things that did work was having more police officers than we'd ever have before. And although the numbers have gone up after having been slashed by the, by the Tories, uh, they're now still per capita. We have fewer police officers than we had under Labour. And if you don't want, if you want the Bobby on the beat, you have to have the numbers uh, uh, there doing the service. So I, I don't agree that for every low-level crime, prison is the answer. But I think uh, Jennifer's absolutely right. The community punishment, um, a community payback where people actually go and have to face the consequences of, the, of what they've done really works. Okay. So let's do what works. I think Jennifer's right. Jennifer, I want to come back to you for a final word before the break and then we'll have more from our panel after the break. Jennifer, what do you make of what you've heard? Yes, I mean, I agree totally with everything that, that's been said because it's how I, I feel. And the other thing that I've always advocated for many years actually now is that if you had on every um, perhaps a parade of shops one shop or, you know, with plenty of empty shops dedicated to a policeman, perhaps with a, 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 a police dog that is patrolling around the streets and anyone in the community could go in anonymously perhaps because mm. most people are frightened of being targeted after they've complained yes and then told them what was going on and we was i mean we see uh, um you know these delivery drivers now they're not only did it's sort of a ruse a lot of it they're not delivering meals they're delivering drugs but with a, a, a package on the back that looks like a meal delivery thing well, some, and you see it going on all the time some of them certainly uh, are but but not all of them of course jennifer we can't, yeah. can't tell them no, all, the not all of them but, no, you, of but, but, but you see that is something that the public pick up that other perhaps the, the, the police yeah, or yeah. the other people don't mm. and going back to knife crime if all this about banning zombie knives and banning this and banning that isn't going to work because 
you should be put away for a long time for even carrying a knife. And David Cameron, when he was in, said you would get five years if you were found with a knife on you. That never happened. No, well, like, well exactly. And, and they'll always get hold of a knife like they always get hold of a gun. Jennifer, you talk a lot of sense. Unfortunately, we've got to go to a break. Otherwise, Chris, the producer, is going to, uh, well, he's, he's going to give me a, a hard stare like Paddington. Um, but uh, plenty more from Matthew Laza and Charlie Downs in just a few minutes here on Talk TV. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. A woman can become a man and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. Slick Rishi seemed intelligent, forensic, even a bit of a statesman, the type of man you'd trust to look after your house while you went on holiday. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. Happy Thursday night. We slick it, poor and timorous beastie. I've got a panic in my breastie. Keir Starmer has accused the government of failing a generation after a record number of young people were killed last year using a knife or sharp object. We need to make sure that when we say we're going to ban them, we actually do ban them. There are so <laughs> many politicians now who just said, my dad was a boss. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like, like, you're David Cameron. No, he wasn't. <laughs> Like brought to you by Sadiq Khan, the Mayor of London. Very rarely meet anybody that says, you know, the thing about London is it's got a great mayor, <laughs> Sadiq Khan, brilliant guy. In the cities, there are areas where there are no vegetables. It's particularly difficult for those people to do what Mark is saying. If he comes up with this argument again, I'll sit on it. <laughs> <laughs> all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? If you're talking about multiculturalism, it's working class white boys who get put in the army. The poorest people in society are the ones who are going to be put on the front line. Something is going horribly wrong. We can do a lot better. Donald Trump didn't just win. He obliterated. This is a guy facing nearly 100 criminal charges, and yet all that's done is actually make him more popular. Trump is canny enough to know that all publicity is good publicity. I don't want a president who's been impeached. If he's able to bamboozle you, or that's the way it comes. I did my six months, I came back, nobody would touch me. I put my head down, I persisted, I carried on. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. Thank you to Simon in Sussex who's been in touch and says when a train is graffitied it is out of service for at least three days, that's three days of lost revenue, find the perpetrator or find the parents. I mean you're talking about thousands and thousands of pounds there Simon, maybe that fits the crime, I don't know. Actions have consequences, people should fear the law, well that's what Charlie has said as well. Charlie Downs is here in the studio with us. Leslie says Yvette Cooper, the MP, tried her best to overturn the biggest democratic Brexit vote, why should we listen to anything she has to say? Um, I've been a police officer for many years, says this texter, the Labour plan will not work. Most of the serious incidents and deaths have involved kitchen knives. John says, hello, Peter, conscription and being subjected to the military environment where respect, discipline and a sense of belonging is engendered is precisely what these errant, responsible individuals who create so much trouble need. David and Preston says, obviously knife crime will stay the same under a Labour policy of simply counselling with no effect at all, uh, says David and Preston. Well, in fairness, there's more to the Labour policy. And actually, um, I've got the full interview with um, Yvette Cooper. We're not going to play it today, but we are going to talk more about knife crime a little bit later on with Peter Blexley, but I want to turn to a couple of other issues with my panel of uh, Charlie Downs, who's a political commentator, and Matthew Laza, former Labour advisor here, uh, because Donald Trump has been uh, walked out of a courtroom after being ordered to pay $83.3 million in a defamation 
case. Matthew, what do you make of this? Well, it's good that uh, at last the uh, the law is catching up with him. And that, uh, he's appealing. Uh, yeah, he's appealing, absolutely, and we'll see what the outcome of that appeal is. But, I mean, the most extraordinary thing is, is that the law has to apply to every citizen in a democracy, uh, and Mr Trump thinks that it doesn't apply to him. Well, sadly, he's getting a, he's getting a rude awakening. And this is particularly, because this isn't one of those political cases that's been uh, that's been brought. It's not one of the ones about the um, the, uh, his uh, attempts to uh, alleged attempts to overturn the results of the last presidential election. This is one about um, uh, how he treated uh, a woman. And uh, you know, I, one of the things I find most extraordinary about American politics is no matter what revelations we get about uh, his his antics, particularly with women, the uh, Christian conser- more Christian conservative voters still back him. So I mean, that's one of the huge ironies for me of American politics. Mick and Wallington, Matthew. Let me put this mm. to you. Mick and Wallington says the persecution of Trump by the left could not be more blatant, it will come back to bite them. Well, I don't think this is the persecution of him by the left. He's been found by a jury of his peers um, uh, for how uh, he, he, he treated a woman who he claims he's never met. Well, that's not what the conclusion of the of the jury uh, in this case is. And in fact, the, uh, the woman was asking for a lot lower uh, amount in damages. And in fact, they gave substantially more because they thought that the that the uh, hurt was uh, and the impact on her life had been, uh, had been even greater. So uh, he's not doing himself any favours. Charlie. Mm, there's a lot at play here. I mean, my gut says that this is this is just a regime attack on Trump. Because if there's one thing that's become very clear, it is that the kind of you know the, the kind of regime that we live under, you know, across the West, is terrified of Trump. A jury has found him guilty. Yeah, well, maybe so, but you know, it's something that I think there's a really useful concept that people should understand, which is um, like Carl Schmitt's friend enemy distinction. Okay, the regime regard Trump as an enemy, and then everything after the fact, you know, the persecution of him is kind of just. Uh, what do you mean by the regime? I mean, you know, we're mm. talking about you know the Republicans run the House of Representatives. Mm. They run most of the governorships across the uh, across the country. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I don't think there is this sort of regime or secret or, or, or sort of mass the blob as we call it here. Mm. Uh, there at all, I think you know you've got uh, you've got, you've got a, a vibrant political system. Yeah, but there's there's a whole layer underneath all the elected politicians, which is kind of like it's like a, a non-governing managerial elite. But in America, I mean, I think you can argue that at the moment about the civil mm. service here. There certainly are issues around mm. uh, groupthink in the civil service. But in America, so many of those positions uh, are, are political appointees, and they change. They change when mm. he was in, when he was president. Some of them change when they, uh, the the house fit, flipped, and some mm. of them will change again uh, if he if he becomes a, a president again. So I don't think there is this this regime ganging up against him. He's got to face the consequences of his actions. I do think that even though they, they, there are positions occupied by Republicans, these could be neocons, these could be people who do regard Trump as an enemy as much as, the, as any Democrat would. To the extent um, that they want Biden to be become to continue being president? I mean, I think that it's in some of their interests to you know, have that remain the case, absolutely. Because, okay. I mean, you know, America is not, like, Biden is not the executive of America. And if you think that he is, then, you know, you, you haven't watched enough of him attempting to give speeches to reporters and stumbling over his words and falling asleep and so on. There are, you know, I don't know who is controlling America at the moment, but it's certainly not Biden. Well, I, would, I mean, those, those Republicans critics of things like his uh, green uh, investment plan and his mm. huge increase in, in, in spending, which he would call investment, uh, in te- technology of the future and in infrastructure across the state uh, would say that he has he has got his hands on the levers, even if, you know, uh, uh, he and his uh, cabinet and his uh, uh, and his administration, even if he does stumble in, in speeches. Uh, mm. we'll, we'll come back to this later in the programme. If you want to get your voice on the air on this particular issue, 0344 499 1000. We'll take as many calls, texts and tweets as we can between now and 1 o'clock, as I always do on this program this is my show but it's your show as well i want to talk a little bit about israel and the uh, international court of justice we'll also be talking about a little a little bit later on we'll be talking about the fact that so few people so many few celebrities international figures are really talking about the horrendous treatment of women specifically the rape as a weapon used against israeli hostages and used in other ways in the uh, middle east Jennifer in Suffolk has been in touch to say Hamas imposed a male guardianship system on the women in Gaza. No one is talking about that in terms of abuse of women. Well, we're going to talk about all of this with Nimco Ali uh, in just a few minutes. So stay with us, Jennifer, and everybody else as well. Um, But in terms of the International Court of Justice, Rishi Sunak has condemned the horrific irony, as he puts it, of the Israel Israel genocide ruling, uh, the UN's top court ruling that Israel must act to prevent genocide in uh, Gaza. We've also had the UN Refugee Agency, various people involved with that, who were celebrating and perhaps even involved in the Hamas attacks as well. So does it have the moral authority, Charlie Downs? Well, my position on the Israel and Gaza conflict has always been, you know, my interest is just in the interest of the British people. That's all I care about. And so, you know, does this affect us directly? No, it doesn't. But in, in a way it does, because there is an enormous number of people in this country now who have arrived here over the last maybe 25 years, vast, vast majority of them, who do have 
and uh, a spiritual, ethnic, religious attachment to this war. Uh, and we've seen them marching in the streets. Um, and I don't, I mean, I, that makes me extremely uneasy to see that in my country. Um, but this, this uh, the uh, international, uh, it's not the International Criminal Court, is it? it's the International Court of Justice, yes. both based at The Hague. Um, it is interesting that this ruling has been brought against Israel and the fact that it's actually being entertained. You know, it's, I think that's very interesting. You don't think it should be entertained at all? Well, I mean, honestly, it, it seems that Israel has... You know, killed a hell of a lot of people. You know, that's 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 just a, a statistic. You know, I don't think that's that's not a value judgment in any kind of a way. Um, and it does seem to me that the most interesting thing about Israel as a state to me is the fact that since its formation in 1948, after the war, it's kind of been allowed. It's it's been allowed to be an exception. You know, with, within America's sphere of influence, i.e., Europe and Israel, it's the only one that's allowed to be openly nationalistic, openly sort of a uh, you know uh, ethnocentric. Uh, you know, if 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 a, if a party in Europe was to uh, stand on that kind of platform, they would be shut down immediately as basically the return of the mid-century Germans, if you want. Yet Israel, in the way that it's governed and the kind of things that its ministers say, is kind of allowed to be this openly nationalist well, thing. I'm and not, I'm not condemning... I'm not sure I, that that's, that that's true. I mean, one of the things we've seen is the American administration condemning the worst excesses of the Israeli government. Look, I'm very in favour of uh, the, uh, the state of Israel's right to exist. I'm very uh, against the uh, Netanyahu government, which I think is uh, a, a, a terrible government for Israel. Uh, and I think that some of the members in it are incredibly extreme. And actually, if you look at this judgment, some of what they said is it needs to... Uh, it, it, one of the things is about incitement to genocide. And we've seen some pretty incendiary things from the uh, far right members of the Netanyahu government uh, who pre prop up his uh, Likud party. So, I mean, look, it is a flawed Incitement institution. Incitement to genocide, though. The, even the word genocide, I is, should point it, out, today is Holocaust Memorial absolutely. Day as well. Uh, and we will actually be talking to Jake Wallace Simons later on, who's under the Jewish Chronicle, about this particular issue. And tomorrow we'll be talking. There are a lot of uh, people who, of course, are, are observing Shabbat uh, today. And we will be talking tomorrow uh, about Holocaust Memorial Day. We would have done it today, but today is obviously the Sabbath for many Jewish people who we would have wanted to speak to didn't want to speak to us today. But, I mean, Matthew, tell us your views on this particular issue. Well, look, on the, on the, uh, on the, uh, the criminal court's uh, ruling, I think that the wording uh, w was uh, went too far. It's, it's interesting that it didn't um, actually uh, uh, say that Israel was causing genocide, which would have been completely wrong. It's, not, it's a rather flawed institution. I looked up who the justices are on this, and there's one from China, and there's one from Russia on there. So, yeah. um, you know, anybody who's complaining about the uh, European uh, Court of Justice, which is the European Convention of Human Rights and the Immigration debate because it has something from San Marino on um, needs to be, uh, you know, these, are, these have got rather a nasty representative and nasty, re nasty rep regime representatives uh, on here. But it is, as the American Secretary of State said at the beginning, how Israel does this matters. And I think that the Israeli government needs to be careful about what it's doing. Matthew, thank you very much indeed. That's Matthew Lazar, who's a former Labour advisor. We also heard from Charlie Downs. Thanks for coming in, Charlie, uh, who's a political commentator. Thank you to both gents. Uh, your Pleasure. views are as important as theirs. 0344 499 1000. You can give us a ring and let us know your thoughts on that. Uh, we'll be uh, back after the break. We'll be talking uh, in uh, just a few minutes to, uh, I think it's Peter Blexit, yes, about this knife crime epidemic, the fact that a Nottingham mother is calling for an inquiry into those horrible killings earlier on, the police feelings there, I think, anyway. She thinks so as well. We'll also be talking about what Sir Keir Starmer has been saying and Yvette Cooper as well and getting your views as well. Stay with us here on Talk TV. This is Talk TV. Want to get to grips with the stories that really matter? To cut through the spin and the BS. Want unvarnished and fiery debate? Then join us for Crosstalk. One o'clock every weekday. We're here! Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Criminals to using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. A woman can become a man and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. Slick Rishi seemed intelligent, forensic, even a bit of a statesman, the type of man you trust to look after your house while you went on holiday. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. Happy Thursday. Uh, uh, we slick it, curing timorous beastie. Open a panic in my breastie. 
Keir Starmer has accused the government of failing a generation after a record number of young people were killed last year using a knife or sharp object. We need to make sure that when we say we're going to ban them, we actually do ban them. There are so many politicians now who just say my dad was a boss. <laughs> yeah. like, like, you're David Cameron. No, he wasn't. <laughs> Like brought to you by Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London. Very rarely meet anybody that says, you know, the thing about London is it's got a great mayor, Sadiq <laughs> Khan, brilliant guy. In the cities, there are areas where there are no vegetables. It's particularly difficult for those people to do what Mark is saying. If he comes up with this argument again, I'll sit on it. <laughs> <laughs> all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? If you're talking about multiculturalism, it's working class white boys who get put in the army. The poorest people in society are the ones who are going to be put on the front line. Something is going horribly wrong. We can do a lot better. Donald Trump didn't just win. He obliterated. This is a guy facing nearly 100 criminal charges, and yet all that's done is actually make him more popular. Trump is canny enough to know that all publicity is good publicity. I don't want a president who's been impeached. If he's able to bamboozle you, or that's the way it comes. I did my six months, I came back, nobody would touch me. I put my head down, I persisted, I carried on. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. I've asked you two questions. Should a mass stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. Just when I was getting used to my show, What Just Happened, being on Talk TV every Friday night at 10.30, they go and change it. I'm furious. They've moved it to 8.30 every Friday. Talk TV. What just happened? I am furious! Hello, I'm Peter Cardwell. Thank you so much for your company today. I've been on for the last hour. We've had a great debate about knife crime, about antisocial behaviour, about what should happen. We've talked about Israel, we've talked about Trump as well. Loads to talk about. We're going to talk more about knife crime in a minute because it's such a big issue. I sat down with the Shadow Home Secretary, Yvette Cooper, this week. We'll hear a little bit of her interview. I want your views on all of this as well. I want your experiences as well about antisocial behaviour, hopefully not of knife crime. But of course, we often know people who this has happened to. 0344 499 1000 is the number to call. You can text me on 87222 with the word talk in your text. You can also tweet me at Talk TV or follow me at Peter Cardwell. Lots of people getting in touch, uh, especially on Israel as well. One person says, Peter, your guest Charlie is applying a one-sided approach to Israel. He displays a lack of historical knowledge, which most commentators of Brazil do. What a shame. Has he ever voiced any criticism against most Arab states surrounding Israel? With the same level of criticism in Syria, China, Somalia, Yemen, Jordan, Iran. Well, he's gone now, but I'll ask him about all of that the next time he's on. TJ in Bedford talking about... Trump says, I always enjoy listening to you, but that Labour hack that was Matthew Laz that we heard about from a second ago seems to focus on Trump as per usual from the left. Surprisingly, it's funny how nothing is mentioned about Biden and the other cor corruption and how it's all Trump, bad Trump, bad Trump, but nothing about Biden. It's all two-tier justice as usual. It's unbelievable how this focus is just on Trump, but not a surprise from the Labour hack. TJ, where have you been? We've talked about Hunter Biden. We've talked about uh, Joe Biden. We've talked about all sorts of family links in Ukraine and all the rest of it. We've done that many times with Jennifer Ewing. We'll continue to do it as well because it's going to be a big election issue and we will continue to cover that in a way that some other parts of the media do not, let's face it. JW says he's a Texas redneck, but he lives in Evesham in Worcestershire. He says, I'm an American in the UK and I've carried a pocket knife for over 50 years. Several police officers know I haven't, but they look at a pocket knife the way I do. It's a tool, not a weapon. Simon in Southport says the National Service debate is completely ridiculous. Gen Z struggle to get out of bed. Would it include all faiths or would some faiths be exempt? As for conscription, I uh, have a Gen Zer, and if two letters arrived, he'd not go, but he'd let me. That's Gen Z, says Simon in Southport. Lots more of those opinions coming your way, including some thoughts on knife crime from Peter Blacksley. In just a second, here on Talk TV.
Well, as I said, the doyen of crime commentary, Peter Blexley, is in the studio with me. Good morning, Peter. Good morning, Peter. Uh, we'll get your thoughts in a second, but I just want to play you a little clip of what Yvette Cooper said to me earlier this week. She gave me a 10-minute interview. I tried to get as much into it as possible. It was never long enough. You always need an hour. Um, and Yvette Cooper, the Shadow Home Secretary, was in Milton Keynes this week. I travelled up there to sit down with her to talk to her specifically about knife crime, which we're going to talk to Peter about in a second. But this is what Yvette Cooper had to say. The question many are asking is, with the government moving on knife crime, it's introduced new legislation today, why is that not enough? What would you do that's further and faster? I think the Conservative government is going nowhere near far enough. Obviously, there have been long delays. I think that we've had about 17 different announcements. They were going to ban zombie knives. They're still on the streets. But they also need to go much further. This ban doesn't include the sort of ninja swords, the kind of real dangerous weapons that have been used in really terrible, fatal stabbings. And also, I don't think they're doing enough to tackle some of the online illegal sales where we think there should be stronger criminal penalties as well. In terms of that, isn't it just the case that the people who are selling these knives and actually making these knives, don't they just innovate to get beyond the law? Is there any way to really catch up with them? That is a risk and that's why you have to both move fast and you have to be much broader in the scope of this ban because otherwise if you just have a set a little measurement here or a change there then they'll just adapt what it is they're making and selling and making profits from and that's why we need a, a much broader ban to take these dangerous weapons off the street but also we want to do a full review of what's happening in terms of age identification some of those checks which again are just not happening it's making it far too easy for young people to get hold of dangerous weapons and to have them on the streets we've got to get them off the streets we're in Milton Keynes today and you're mm. doing a sort of three-day blitz talking about this what have you learned in Milton Keynes today well, we've been talking to local police officers, to the chief constable, to local community organisations here. They've done a lot of work here and I came here some time ago because they were having real problems with knife crime. They've done a lot of work here to try and tackle that and to work together. And so we were hearing about the things that they found that made a difference are the things we're calling for nationally. Really early, fast intervention. Making sure that you've got the youth workers that are ready to step in in a and &E units they can move fast or in custody suites to be able to get straight on with the action that is needed to get young people back on track to prevent them re-offending we've got to have much stronger action so you don't have young people just falling through the net and a major new prevention program the young futures program that we want to roll out right across the country well, there we are. That is the Shadow Home Secretary, Yvette Cooper. She was talking to me a couple of days ago. Um, I'll play out the whole interview tomorrow. We'll have time to discuss that because you talked about lots of other things about immigration and so on. But specifically on knife crime, Peter Blexley is here, a veteran of law enforcement in this country, former Metropolitan Police detective. Peter, innovative new ideas that are going to magically solve the problem or the same old stuff we've heard for years? Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> okay. Wind window dressing, most of it. Just rehashed, reinvented kind of empty, hollow politician statements. We had a load of them from the other side this week as well with the Home Secretary, James Cleverly, and their pledge to outlaw the manufacture, sale and distribution of these knives. Little do they realise that anybody who wants to get one of those will simply go onto the dark web and source them with impunity, I'm sure. Sad to say. OK. Some legislation is fine, but at the end of the day, you can put as many laws as you like onto the statute book, but they're utterly pointless unless you have firm, robust, determined police forces, the length and breadth of the country, that are actually going to do something. And I don't mean, yet again, the window dressing of social work, which so many coppers would love to go off and do as part of being policing, um, it's, it seems to be increasingly a part of policing in the last few years. Yeah, all under the uh, under the the guise and the the kind of deception of community engagement. There's a community that the police should engage with, and that's the community that commits crime. They need to find them. They need to lock them up, gather the evidence, put cases together, and charge people. Less window dressing, more stop and search, 
did Yvette Cooper talk about stop and search with your interview, Peter? No, she she No, well, there's a surprise, eh? Because we know that people of her political persuasion, including Sadiq Khan, have been very keen to kind of reduce the amount of powers that police can have around stop and search because they buy in to this whole nonsense that it's disproportionate and that it's built on racism. It was once upon a time, now when the police put in the, these powers in place and carry out stop and search, they're trying to stop bloodshed. Mm. Um, as Mark in Southampton says, blah, 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 exactly, Peter, totally useless BS, says Mark. Um, Nick says, hi, Peter, please read this out, as I was followed and kicked in the head, which Greater Manchester Police in Rochdale in 2008 did nothing, yet I bumped into one of my attackers six years ago, and I was walking in the other direction, and he was boasting to his mate that he beat me up, and he was proud of himself, and that's the sort of despicable attitude they have, as in 2008, both Keir was uh, Director of Public Prosecutions, and Burnham was in government, and nobody in 15 years has said anything at all. Well, Nick, uh, someone has said something, we've talked about it now on the radio, and that is the experience of too many people, where things happen, and then nothing happens, Peter. Oh, my inbox and my social media messages, uh, every day I hear tales of woe from people who have been victims of crime. Um, and, and they're utterly appalling stories. But And these are very contemporary. Not only Nick's attack in 2008, I, have, I hear stories on a daily basis of people that are victims of crime and they do not get the level of service they require, if in fact they get any service, mm, mm. from their police. Mm -hmm. Policing is in absolute crisis. I could be here all day telling you truthful stories from reliable sources of mine that tell me what a catastrophic state policing is in. And it's about time that Home Secretaries, senior police, I know I'm being a bit fanciful here, senior police actually got a grip, looked themselves in the mirror and then looked towards the public and said, what do the public want mm. from their police service? Well, that's what I always ask. I also I always ask politicians, what do your constituents say about this? Not what, what do you say, what do your constituents say about this? Mick has been in touch and says, knife crime and the breakdown of law and order will never be stopped unless useless police chiefs are held to account. I think Peter would agree with that. Um, Chris, maybe we can get a couple of calls. We're just talking to Chris, the producer, as well. We've got a couple of calls, and maybe uh, Peter can respond to them as well. John says, Peter, regarding zombie knives, most of the stabbings are done with normal kitchen knives, many of which can be very nasty. That's John Presley in Burnham on Sea. Yvette Cooper says, Mick is the most insincere sincere politician in the Labour Party. Too many acting lessons. Dan says, where I grew up, we had a Peter Blexley type Bobby on the street. We had respect for each other. Now in rural Kent, I don't walk the dog when kids are out of school. They are disrespectful, mouthy yobs who live in a TikTok world. And actually, what Dan says there is right, because it's not just about the really, really bad people who are carrying around zombie knives and stabbing people. It's about the low... I don't want to say that. low level is the phrase at the moment, and it doesn't feel low level if you're a victim of crime, it's or even if you're even if you're just not proud of your neighbourhood anymore because there's antisocial behaviour. It's it's just a lot of people are just really frustrated and not happy to live in Britain anymore, which is a country they want to feel proud of. I live in a leafy London suburb, and every day because my wife monitors the traffic on a local kind of neighbourhood chat kind of group, and we hear appalling stories of people being frightened of people being assaulted of crime on an almost daily basis and this is replicated the length and breadth of the country and your texter there who talked about and thank you for the fact he said there was a cop like me that they knew the key word there the absolute key word respect now you see you don't have to like someone to respect them yes but the trouble is all these fluffy woke liberal police leaders these days foolishly think and incorrectly think that policing is a popularity contest mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and it mm -hmm. isn't it's why they paint their faces hold various groups flags want to be aligned to every minority group whether that be minority through sexuality faith gender whatever it is can't be everybody's best man they want to be popular. Yeah. Policing is not a popularity contest. In fact, you should wear it as a badge of honour that you're unpopular, unpopular with criminals. And that doesn't mean to say that all the public's going to like you, but if you're unpopular with criminals, guess what? The public will respect you.
Can I just ask you about two stories, one of which was um, Susan contacted me on Twitter last night to make me aware of something I hadn't been aware of, actually, which is about Bournemouth. Uh, there was a stabbing there, five people injured in a brawl near a college. as a massive fight with 20 people breaking out, three people arrested. Now, this was near a, a hotel that asylum seekers are housed in. We don't know who's involved. We don't know if asylum seekers are involved. That seems to be what has been the case, but we don't know that for sure. So let's just be really careful. There are people who've been arrested and so on. Um, there are people treated at the scene and so on, wounding with intent, or some of the uh, people have been arrested on suspicion of that. This is just another uh, indictment of our society, I think, Peter. So here we have it in the latest census. Bournemouth, Christchurch and Paul, a population of just under 200,000, 80% of whom originate from the UK, the, then, the, the largest minority thereafter originate from Europe. You would think that at quarter to three on a Thursday afternoon in Bournemouth, you might be safe to walk along yeah. any street yeah. as you either go to collect the kids from school, do a bit of shopping, return from work, whatever it might be that you're engaging. But no, on Thursday, you could have run into a very unpleasant altercation where people were seriously injured. There was more than five ambulances, air ambulance, loads of resources called to this almighty great tear-up. The helicopter we, involved as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where, where we know that a knife and a broken bottle, at least those two weapons were used. Some arrests were made. Injured people went to hospital. And as I've tried to follow it up today in the media, there's no update no. from Bournemouth Police. The police are saying very, happened. very little. Yeah. Very little. Yeah. And, and, and why is that? Communication is key. We know so much police communication. I think we can draw our own conclusions from the fact that they're not telling us things. And there's a lot more to come out about this. And Susan got in touch with me on Twitter last night, and thank you for that. We'll, we'll return to that story. Maybe it's tomorrow on another occasion. I also want to ask your opinion, Peter, on one of the biggest stories this week. Absolutely horrendous in Nottingham. Just tell us briefly what happened with this uh, Valdo Calcone guy. What happened to people he stabbed, a paranoid schizophrenic. Absolutely horrendous. And so many things that he has done that could have been prevented. This wicked, evil, monstrous waste of space took the lives of three people, Barnaby, Grace and Ian. Barnaby and Grace were students at the University of Nottingham. I hope that all the bereaved families and everybody who, who, who lost loved ones will forgive me just for a moment because my youngest son came out of the same nightclub at the same time as Grace and Barnaby. He's at Nottingham Uni. I didn't know that. He and, his, he and his mate got in a taxi rather than walking. Yes. They would have walked the same route as Grace and Barnaby. We had some fears, obviously, when the story broke because we couldn't raise Ben. He was doing what a student should do after a late night out and was asleep. So the kind of anxiety we, we suffered, of course, pales into utter irrelevant insignificance compared with the horrors that Calacane carried out in murdering Grace and Barnaby and, and Ian. Um, yes, a dreadful, dreadful set of situation. Uh, Calacani also pleaded guilty to attempted murder of three other people because he stole Ian Coates' van and then drove it headlong into three other people who were facing the opposite way from the van, I hasten to add. Utterly murderous spree. Calacani pleaded guilty to manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility which has caused massive frustrations with the families, understandably so. Um, Grace's wonderful dad, who's a doctor, um, spoke about a lack of toxicology. And I'd just like to focus on this for the moment, if we may. It is a known fact that some people who indulge in smoking a lot of cannabis can develop psychosis or schizophrenia. That's a fact. Of course, not every cannabis smoker. I'm not saying that for a moment. But some people do. Now, uh, Gracie's dad said there was no toxicology evidence. So mm. clearly when Calacani got nicked, uh, a senior officer didn't see it fit to apply for a, a, an intimate sample to be taken. In other words, a blood sample to yeah, be taken yeah. so that perhaps they could check it to see if you there was a presence of any drugs in it. Yeah. No evidence like that was put forward. So... Um, Gracie's dad mentioned that when he was speaking outside the court. 
I now would like to ask, ask this question. And I don't have any evidence at all to suggest that Calacani was a cannabis user, but I'd like to find out. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. just say, for example, there was evidence. Bearing in mind, he graduated himself from the University of Nottingham in 2022. Mm -hmm. So he's hung around, you know, university. Yes. Other people have known him where he's lived around the country, other offences and such like. Does anybody out there know and have evidence and be willing to speak to me about any possible or potential drug taking by Valdo Calacane? Yeah. If, and I say this is a very big if, I'm not accusing him of that, but it's a big if. Yeah. Imagine if a number of people come forward and they say, yes, we would like to give evidence that he was a heavy cannabis user. That is fresh, brand new evidence, potentially. Yes. That could be put forward. It might, just might, lead to the to the uh, guilty plea to manslaughter by diminished responsibility being set aside and he being actually tried for murder. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, if his mental illness was brought about by yes. drug use, yes. he cannot then plead guilty to manslaughter by diminished responsibility. You lose that. And I've heard nobody mention it yeah. Yeah, yeah. at all which is why I, and thank you to you and the station for enabling me to do that. If you knew Calacane and you knew anything about drug taking, please get in touch. Peter, will you stay with us over the break? I just want to put a couple of calls to you. Is that okay? Of You're course. not in any great rush. We're talking about Valdu Calacane here, who is a horrendous perpetrator. I want us to remember the names of his victims that are much more important. Ian Coates, Barnaby Weber, and Grace O'Malley Kumar. Let's remember them. We're going to t uh, take a couple of calls with Peter. Then we're going to talk to an activist who is a brilliant uh, campaigner about the fact that rape and using that as a, as a weapon against hostages in Israel is not being talked about at all. On this show, as always, we try to talk about the things that aren't being talked about, like Bournemouth, for example, and the stabbing there. Stay with us here on Talk TV. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. A woman can become a man and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. Slick Rishi seemed intelligent, forensic, even a bit of a statesman, the type of man you trust to look after your house while you went on holiday. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. Happy Thursday night. Uh, we slick it, curing timorous beastie. Open a panic in thy beastie. Keir Starmer has accused the government of failing a generation after a record number of young people were killed last year using a knife or sharp object. We need to make sure that when we say we're going to ban them, we actually do ban them. There are so many politicians now who just said my dad was a boss. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. like, you're David Cameron. No, he wasn't. <laughs> Like brought to you by Sadiq Khan, the Mayor of London. Very rarely meet anybody that says, you know, the thing about London is it's got a great mayor, <laughs> Sadiq Khan, brilliant guy. In the cities, there are areas where there are no vegetables. It's particularly difficult for those people to do what Mark is saying. If he comes up with this argument again, I'll sit on it. <laughs> <laughs> all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? If you're talking about multiculturalism, it's working class white boys who get put in the army. The poorest people in society are the ones who are going to be put on the front line. Something is going horribly wrong. We can do a lot better. Donald Trump didn't just win. He obliterated. This is a guy facing nearly 100 criminal charges, and yet all that's done is actually make him more popular. Trump is canny enough to know that all publicity is good publicity. I don't want a president who's been impeached. If he's able to bamboozle you, that's the way it comes. I did my six months, I came back, nobody would touch me. I put my head down, I persisted, I carried on. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won. is very telling. 
Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Thanks to everybody who's been in touch, including Gareth, who says maybe we can utilise our relationship with Rwanda and ship our knife crime offenders there. Well, I'm sure Rwanda don't want them. Uh, Pete says, I'm probably too old to fight on the front line in a future war, but I worked in the defence industry for 36 years and I would be good at providing integrated logistical support. You're right, Pete, actually. There's a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of the warfare is done from behind, uh, you know, and done in different ways. It's not just young men or women fighting. It's, uh, as we sort of just think about it previously, there are lots of rules that people could play and maybe, Pete, I'm sure they'd be glad to hear from you. Dave says, as a retired police officer, stop employing students. Get back to recruiting real people with a bit of life experience and get them back on foot patrol for the two-year probation period, dealing with jobs and criminals with a firm hand. Sue on text says, Yvette Cooper's interview is just comforting words to calm the population. How is she going to deal with the dysfunctional home office with six police forces and special measures, dysfunctional prison and judicial system? It's no good making anything illegal if you cannot enforce it, says Sue in Chelmsford. Spot on. Uh, Jane says, Peter is spot on. Thank you. Straight to prison, or Peter Peter Black say I think rather than me. Uh, six months, first offence, five years, second, straight to prison, relax, power around, stop and search, and let police police. Um, says that person. Uh, our local Bobby was PC Petfield, says Simon in Sussex. He was hard as nails, we had the utmost respect for him. All he had to say was, I'll have a word with your dad. And we were terrified. Um, yeah, I remember I remember people like that in my in my youth were just, I'll have a word with them. Gosh. And it sounds even more sinister in a Northern Irish accent. Um, I forget the lady, oh, the name of the lady from Cornwall last week who you invited into the studio. That was Sarah. But this person says I'd be willing to supply transport and fuel. Very, very kind. Thank you very much indeed. And we cover parking. Uh, Gary, uh, we the, the invitation is open to Sarah from Cornwall to come in and be on the panel. Gary is in Leeds. Gary, you've been very patient. What would you like to say to me and indeed to Peter Blexley as well? Yeah, I just want to ask Peter a question. Uh, Peter, would you agree that the only way to, uh, the only surefire way of actually ridding this country of this scourge, of this appalling knife uh, epidemic, is to quickly, uh, the, the lawmakers of this country, introduce very tough prison sentencing, even just for the possession of any bladed weapon, which would then cover every aspect of weapon that, that, somebody, that somebody carries, and not just give them some some uh, some really fluffy sentence of a few months, give them a five-year sentence, make them serve the five-year sentence, and then obviously this would be a, 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 a quick-fire deterrent. Obviously, we're going to need a few more prisons to house these people, but I, I and myself and many other people I've spoken to uh, agree that this would pretty much stop... It's, I, I don't think knife crime would exist within six months to a year, I think all the people would think, oh, they got these guys are now being given five years. Well, Gary, let's find out what Peter Blexley has to say about that. Yeah, Gary, sure. by, by and large, I agree with you. I don't think we'd entirely eliminate the issue. I think that's fanciful, but I think we could tackle it um, head on with this. And as you quite rightly point out, the jails are full. There's not enough prison cells available. What I need to say, though, is I wouldn't want that five-year detention applying to say, for example a 13-year-old child who lives in an inner-city area that's plagued by a knife crime and naively and stupidly takes a knife out of the kitchen drawer because they think that will make them safer and then gets caught. That oh, kind yeah, of child needs educating, yeah. proper educating, in a stern environment, regain some discipline, understand the, 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 the errors of their ways. But if we're talking about an 18-year-old adult fully cognizance of everything they're doing, take a knife out on the streets. Yeah, why not? Bang them up, give them five years. Gary? Yeah, I, I totally I totally agree with you. I think, obviously, when it comes to a 12, 13, 14, 15-year-old child, there has to be some uh, some discretion. And, obviously, th this child is probably, like you said, he's it's, it's been influenced or he's had a panic and he's just thought, well, someone's threatened me. And he's a child, after all. He's, he's not an adult. He's, he's, he's not a... It's not a, an adult who knows the consequence. Maybe some maybe some some child is is, is not particularly uh, sort of clued up on, on on what would happen. Obviously, if if, if he did have to use a knife, you know. So yeah, I I would totally agree. There has okay. to be some discretion. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed, Gary. Let's go to. Oh no, we've lost. Um, 
Anne's dropped out. We'll get we'll get Anne back. I'll go to a couple of texts here. Um, where is talk getting all these people from uh, from who don't understand the concept of a mental illness? Says Chris in Oxfordshire. Um, he is he is ill. End of. We can all be as angry as we want, but it doesn't change the fact that the judge sentenced to the letter of the law. He'll spend a very long time, probably the rest of his life, in a secure hospital, which is not a nice environment. Peter, I've been hospitalised twice through catastrophic mental health breakdowns. So for Chris to allege that I know nothing about mental health is quite fundamentally wrong. I still, to this day, take a tiny dose of maintenance medication because it keeps me well and I can function properly and enjoy life. I had what I'll describe as wonky thinking when I was poorly. I fully, completely and utterly get it. But to suggest that I would ever have gone on a murderous rampage armed with knives, a rucksack and set out to snuff out lives in the manner that Calacane did, no, that's just not the situation. Uh well, Chris in Newbury says, the only thing wrong with this country is that we cannot vote for Peter Blexley to run the police. If Rishi Sunak wants to win in November, he makes Peter Lord Blexley of the Sweeney and makes him Home Secretary, says Chris in Newbury. What do you make of that? <laughs> uh, well, I haven't had my breakfast shit. Uh, yeah, no, no, yes, yes, I'll, I'll happily... No. I mean, you remind me a bit of the Sweeney. Will you say, shut it? Shut it. Me and the Lords. <laughs> me and the House of Lords. Could you imagine it? I think, I think it would make it even more determined... Um, anyway, let's talk to Jackie in Manchester. Uh, Jackie, what would you like to say to me and to Peter Blacksley? Yeah, about the antisocial behaviour problem. Um, unfortunately, I think it's it's a multifaceted problem, and the politicians have a lot to answer for with half of the reasons why we've got antisocial behaviour. And unfortunately, the police are the ones that pick up the problems. Now, if you've got, and I, I heard this on Julia Hartley Brewer's show, she had the children's hour on, and Longsfield, and she was saying that the statistics show that one in six children are living in unstable families, whether that be through mental health problems, drug problems, alcohol, domestic abuse, child abuse, that is a damning statistic. It's, it's broken Britain, Jackie. It is, it is. And, you know, Starmer talks about communities. What communities have we got? There's a lot of people that don't even know the next door neighbour, don't even speak to the next door neighbour. And if you add on to that, the fact of mass migration and lack of integration um we've we we have segregated societies all in one country now we used to have support mechanisms in we used to have community police officers police officers that would go into schools police officers that knew the local community that's all gone we used to have neighborhood watch schemes where Residents would get they, they, they do still exist, but Jackie, you're, you're painting a very accurate picture of Britain today. And it's not about harping back to the past or saying it's nostalgia for everything was perfect in the 50s and 60s and 70s. Of course it wasn't. But Peter, Jackie's right, isn't she? That there's so much of the fabric of society, the stuff that held people together and kept law and order on a low level, a high level, all levels, working. What a brilliant caller Jackie is. She is great. I love she, Jackie. She, she's just nailed it on so many levels. And let's not duck the difficult issues. There are some communities largely populated by immigrant populations that have not assimilated into UK life and they police themselves. There are some communities that apply their own rule, their own law, Sharia law, in certain areas of... of inner cities and this of course is detrimental to the wider community cohesion what jackie says about neighborhood watch is right that's diminished and as for neighborhood policing that was decimated sacrificed largely on the altar of counter-terrorism policing requirements and austerity and i think even the politicians even the dullest politicians are finally realizing that that needs to be a cornerstone of policing. But just while I'm on policing, this woke liberal rot that is at the heart 
of senior policing was was shown to me perfectly exhibited the other day the, uh, for one particular police division the top three jobs for the first time ever were filled with women by senior women officers no problem with that apart from when they called everybody together for a briefing one of the officers struck a pose and they chanted girl power <laughs> that's the, the police service <sighs> if i'd been in that briefing I'd have suddenly found a very valid reason to get up and walk out. How can you work for clowns like that? It's a very, very good point. Um, Jackie, thanks for your call. Timothy's in West Yorkshire. Timothy, what would you like to say? You're very welcome to the programme. Um, it's the first time I've talked on your... Uh, well, you're, you're, you're very welcome. Don't make it the last time. Let us know. Tell us what you think, Timothy. I personally think that the police have no interest in what's called petty crimes. Um, I have two chocolate Labradors and I take them out lo to my local park. There's a man there who has an Excel bully dog. Now, I let my dogs run wild in the park, run free. And um, he, whenever he sees Sh me... Sh he shouldn't, you me shouldn't you keep them on a lead? Sorry? Shouldn't you keep them on a lead, Timothy? Or maybe there's an no, enclosed area? No, in this park, well... In this park, there is a, a notice at the beginning of the park saying dogs are allowed to run, to 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 burn off the lead. Okay. Uh, when I see this man with the XL bully, he's abusive to me. He tells me to put my dogs on a lead, which they're quite allowed to be not on a lead. Um, he's abusive to me. He's threatened to me. In fact, the last time he saw me, I was with my sister. And he said to me, next time you're on your own, I'm going to let this dog off at you. So, Timothy, what have you, rude, have, you reported them, have you reported them to the police or what have, what have you done? Several times I've reported them to the police, the local police. And basically, the only thing they can tell me is um, go somewhere else. Oh, Tim, for Tim, Tim, a spot of no, advice Tim. here. A, top, a, a spot of advice for you, OK? Next time you're walking with your sister... And if this man comes up and threatens you and abuses you, record it. Get your get your sister to kind of surreptitiously, discreetly record it on her phone. Not that it's going to put her in greater risk. I don't want her doing that. But if she can do it safely, without being seen, without being noticed, the audio would be fine. As long as you get a decent recording, then record it. The police telling you to go elsewhere is utterly appalling and just goes to show what a huge disconnect there is between the public and the police. The police always want the easy option as opposed to the challenging option, which means to properly deal with an issue. Uh, Gary has been in touch. He says, my son was attacked just this week with someone with a zombie knife. Thankfully, he was OK, but every day I worry about my son's safety when he's out and about. Uh, best wishes from Gary. Guy, I'm so sorry that you have that experience it's just it's just grim for so many people Anne is in Hertfordshire Anne what would you like to say you're very welcome to the program yes good morning Peter well I'd like to say um for the government to be using this as a political issue is disgusting I blame them for some of this the parents and the children but the government have taken away their clubs the places they go to the kids have got no hope and also, there's too many children being buried in the graveyard. It's got to stop. It's so worrying, and there's so As a much... Parent, I'm a parent of two children, and whenever I hear of a child being killed or read it in the paper, it breaks my heart. There's so many people like Anne, aren't there? As a country, we've got to get together and stop this. I completely agree with you, Anne, and this is in a week where a 15-year-old has been charged with murdering a 17-year-old. Yeah. And so the dreadful beat of bloodshed goes on. It's grim. It's grim. Um, listen, thank you to Peter Blacksey. Peter very kindly stayed on a bit longer. We, we've been struggling to get in touch with Nim Koali, who we want to talk to. Maybe we'll get in touch with her. We're going to talk about other things in a minute. Uh, but I just want to tell you this great message from Dan from Kent, who says, Peter Blacksey is a pr proper Inspector Regan. There we are, uh, from the Sweeney. It was a great series. Listen, Peter, thank you very much indeed. This Peter Blexley, who's a former Metropolitan uh, Police detective. He's also the host of Crime Suspects. It was on last night, Peter. It was. It was on at 9.30 last night on Talk TV. We're very pleased that we've made it onto the main channel. But don't fear not if you didn't watch it. If you go onto YouTube, 
Search up Crime Suspect Talk TV, Peter Blexi. You'll see it and all the back episodes are there as well. Crime Suspects with Peter Crime Blexi. Suspects. Well worth a watch as well. But don't go anywhere. We'll have plenty more to discuss in a moment here on Talk TV. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. A woman can become a man and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. Slick Rishi seemed intelligent, forensic, even a bit of a statesman, the type of man you trust to look after your house while you went on holiday. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. Happy Thursday. Uh, uh, we slick it, cool and timorous beastie. Open a panic in thy beastie. Keir Starmer has accused the government of failing a generation after a record number of young people were killed last year using a knife or sharp object. We need to make sure that when we say we're going to ban them, we actually do ban them. There are so many politicians now who just say, my dad was a boss. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like, you're David Cameron. No, he wasn't. <laughs> Like brought to you by Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London. Very rarely meet anybody that says, you know, the thing about London is it's got a great mayor, Sadiq <laughs> Khan, brilliant guy. In the cities, there are areas where there are no vegetables. It's particularly difficult for those people to do what Mark is saying. If he comes up with this argument again, I'll sit on it. <laughs> <laughs> all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? If you're talking about multiculturalism, it's working class white boys who get put in the army. The poorest people in society are the ones who are going to be put on the front line. Something is going horribly wrong. We can do a lot better. Donald Trump didn't just win. He obliterated. This is a guy facing nearly 100 criminal charges, and yet all that's done is actually make him more popular. Trump is canny enough to know that all publicity is good publicity. I don't want a president who's been impeached. If he's able to bamboozle you, or that's the way it comes. I did my six months, I came back, nobody would touch me. I put my head down, I persisted, I carried on. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. I've asked you two questions. Should a mass stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. Now then, Harry and Meghan have been up to their old tricks, haven't they? They want to become royals for hire, apparently, after their disastrous Netflix and Spotify deals are being saddled with huge expenses. They're also uh, at a film premiere in Jamaica, a biopic of uh, Bob Marley, and the fact that, uh, well, they're, they're, just, they're causing all sorts of problems, and Jamaica uh, is a big issue because uh, there was a plot earlier to oust the king as the island's head of state. Um, ha Harry and Meghan are there, are there, were there in the last few days, but also uh, William and Kate were there, and they were pretty much humiliated by the Jamaicans who want to, want to replace uh, their, their, both William and uh, Harry's father as head of state. Let's talk to Rupert Bell, who's Talk TV royal correspondent. Rupert, you're very welcome to the programme. Um, I mean, they're, they're just up their old tricks, really, aren't they? And they know, Harry and Meghan know, that their star is fading. Rupert? Have we got Rupert Bell? Oh, we have a couple of tech issues, um, but we'll get Rupert Bell in a second. Um, I'll see if we've got any texts and tweets. Yeah, uh, well, no, we don't. We don't, actually, at the moment. But, um, yes, would someone put Peter Blexley in charge of national police for, uh, the National Police Force? A no-nonsense, straight-talking guy with wisdom, complete legend. Totally agree, totally agree. Um, there's also a, a lot of um, 
a lot of people getting in touch about their experiences of police officers. We've been talking about knife crime this whole morning. We've been talking about uh, the fact that people have been dealing with knife crime, but also the more, don't like the phrase low level, but petty crimes and things that are smaller and just how people feel about their their lives is a, is a very, very tough thing. Chris in Weston Supermare says, we had a local beat officer back in the 70s and 80s. He stood in front of 30 plus skinheads and told them to go home. They all did, chanting his name in respect. Now then, the date night for the supposedly privacy-loving couple was uh, glad-handling Hollywood executives on a red carpet. Uh, you know, what's going on with Harry and Meghan? They're up to the little tricks. Rupert, I think we have you now, Rupert Bell, our royal correspondent. Yeah, um, well, it's interesting that they do go to Jamaica. Clearly, when William and Kate went there, the optics weren't necessarily brilliant. The way they conducted that tour, there was some unfortunate imagery coming from that. But clearly, Meghan and Harry feel that it's... Uh, they know the island well, but it was too good an opportunity to just put themselves in a, a spotlight. Now, clearly, it's not an easy one for the British government here, because, look, they know what's happened to Barbados and that they have now severed ties with... They do have the king as a head of state. So we've seen Caribbean nations going in that direction. So it's nothing unusual. But clearly, Meghan and Harry being seen with the Jamaican Prime Minister is an uneasy look for the British government and the royal family, because clearly they see that they're sort of slightly cocking a snoop and you can't sugarcoat it any other way. Now, they may have wanted to have been at that premiere, as Harry said, you know, wouldn't have missed it. But clearly, flying in a private jet with a chief executive of Paramount Pictures clearly adds an extra dimension to it. And obviously, Harry's been seen at that award a week before. You feel they're trying quite hard to create some relevance to their situation. Mm. They're no longer members of the royal family. So what are they doing it for? But Clearly, I... for publicity for their own brand. It can't be for any other reason. Are, is there a worry they'll... Well, a worry for them that they'll run out of money, perhaps, a very expensive security bill, so they kind of have to be royals for Harry Rupert? <laughs> Well, yes, and they need to fund their lifestyle. He, of course, has been moaning about his security arrangements in this country, but he's clearly happy to go to Jamaica, which, you know, clearly, you know, there would have been plenty of security around, given that the prime minister was there, but, you know, not straightforward again. So, you know, you feel at times they want their cake and eat it, and it, it clearly wasn't necessarily quite the publicity they wanted. You know, there were some scenes that they weren't quite happy with the seating arrangements, but they are trying, you feel they're trying very hard at the moment. Well, look, they've got to make a living and no one's begrudging them that. But to absolutely as, as openly as that be seen with a prime minister who's made his views on the British family, royal family quite clear on how, where he sees his country heading, and he's every right to do that. There's, yeah. Excuse me, there's nothing unusual about that. But clearly with Meghan and Harry at his side, adds an extra dimension to it. Uh, Rupert, thank you for that. You're clearly at the races. Are you at the races today? I am at Cheltenham Races. Trials Day. We've got the festival coming up in six weeks' time, so it's a big day. Hence the reason why there's quite a lot of noise <laughs> going on in the background. Any, um, any, so any, tips, any tips for this afternoon? A Victorino in the 115, if you really insist, uh, Peter. But uh, as people who know me on Tool Sport know that my reputation as a tipster is pretty shocking. So, um, but fingers crossed, that'll do all right. OK, well, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Rupert Bell there at the race. As, he, as you may know, Rupert is our royal correspondent, but he also does uh, horse racing coverage for uh, Talk Sport. So we've managed to grab him today when he's doing a, doing a bit of both there. Lots of people want to get in touch. Uh, Rob in rugby has given me a ring on 0344. 499-1000, you can do the same thing. Rob, you're very welcome to the programme. Good morning. Good morning, and thanks very much for uh, listening to me. No worries. You're, you're an ex-serviceman, I think. Yes, yes. Um, I listen many times on many channels about knife crime, uh, about yobbism with the, with the, with the youngsters, etc., etc., and I find it very frustrating. We talk about putting them harder sentences, putting them in jail uh, when the jails are full, um, and uh, my experience is that my, uh, I joined the uh, Royal Air Force um, many, many years ago. My first tour was to Singapore. Uh, sorry, it was to Sharjah, which was next door to Dubai. Dubai was an absolute basket case. Um, yet, with strict rules and 
far stricter than we could ever, ever have in this country. Look at where Dubai is. My next tour was in the late 60s, early 70s to Singapore. Uh, Singapore was also a basket case. And what happened? They had a president come in called Lee Kuan Yew who took the, 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 the populace. They made them come out on Saturday to clean their own villages. He tightened up the police force. He put a horrendous fines on people for, for leaving standing water so, so that, you know, uh, uh, mosquitoes could um, uh, uh, thrive. You, 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 were, you were told to, to please, you know, uh, tell on your neighbours if they had standing water. And then in the um, uh, early 70s, 73, I went on a special duties, uh, and this is the, my main point, a special duties posting with NATO to Belgium. Now, the law in Belgium was at that stage that parents were responsible for their children, totally responsible. And if it, it seemed very harsh, and as a British serviceman, I thought this would never happen in the UK. Is it too harsh? Is, allowed... is, is what you're describing, is it too harsh or is it enough? Is it what should happen uh, uh, in well, this country, Rob? At the, at the time, I thought it was too harsh. But uh, there was a case there with two young children, I think they were about eight or ten years old, uh, set fire to a factory, and that factory burned down. The parents were taken to court with the children. The parents were then made to pay, and it was in the millions of francs at the time. They were made to pay until the children reached an age of majority, and then the children would then take over that debt. And I tell you what, while I was there, the, the, the Belgian children going to school, etc., etc., were like a hundred times better behaved than our children. And what I see now, and I've had personal experience of this, is parents are not, they're absolving any responsibility for their children. And if we just made parents totally, totally, totally responsible for their children up to the age of majority and then took them to court and had harsh penalties on the parents... And on an aside, you mentioned about somebody with a dog. You know, we punish the dog, but we don't punish the owners enough. You know, we need to take it back to the root causes that we had and we were brought up with respect for our parents, respect for the law, respect for the police. Now there's none. And I'm sorry, I'm a bit the same. I don't respect the police anymore. I well, don't this, this is it, Rob. There are so many people who don't, and I wonder how that respect comes back because it's not just about the police really is it i mean you're you're sort of what you're talking about and i and i get it and it has clearly worked in many ways in singapore although there's some things that happened in singapore i'm not too happy with that that you're almost kind of doing it backwards in a way you're saying here is the very very strong state here's a very very strong law and order framework you have to fit into that surely it's about all those people taking personal responsibility as well and you say the parents but there's so many parents who are absolutely useless and are not parenting their children at all yes i i totally agree with you totally agree with you that they are useless but do we say because they're useless they get away with it that's no. good point very good point and, and and i i and something i just want to get over and i know you've let me speak for some time and i thank you for go that go for it go for it rob uh, 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 one of my best friends when i was in south africa had the most beautiful daughter who finished her her degree and went backpacking around europe and australia and she came to me this beautiful young lady over 20 years ago and she said something to me that that is happening now and is a shock. She turned around and said, the problem that's happening now is the right of the individual has become more important than the rights of society. And until we reverse that, until we reverse that, we are going to go downhill in a downward spiral. We have to make the rights of society more important than the rights of the individual. Rob, you speak perfect sense. I can't disagree with a single word you said. And thank you for your service to our country as well. That's Rob and Rugby there. Great call. Call of the day so far, I think. Uh, although he may be beaten, who knows, by Colin in Darlington. He's also given me a call on 0344 499 1000. Colin, you're very welcome to the programme. Good morning to you. What would you like to say? Good morning, Peter. Very fine show, as per usual. Thank you. Peter, I would just like to discuss the thing about um, national service. Yeah, sure. Now, um, 
let's, let's look back at when people came into national service initially, when they first started it in the late 40s and 50s. Those people came from villages and small towns where um, they hadn't slept in a bed with clean sheets. They hadn't had money in their pockets. They hadn't travelled abroad. They hadn't had the friends that they're going to make in the military. And all these things that they never had, they didn't have three square meals a day. And um, and suddenly they go into the military and they've got their three square meals a day and um, they've got travel, they've got money in their pocket, they've got friends and all these sort of things that they never had. Yes. Look at the modern kids coming into, and if you say bring them in on national service, they have all those things. They've travelled abroad. They've got money in their pockets. They've got designer clothes. They got the top of the range mobile phone, and all these things. They've slept in sheets, you know, and and they've had clothes on their back. But all these things, they've got. So the military can't give them anything new. It could maybe give them a bit of discipline, though, Car uh, Colin, uh, a bit of, a bit of structure, perhaps that some people don't have. You, you did you serve in the military yourself? I did 26 years as a regular soldier. I did 12 years TA and 12 years with the Army Cadet. Goodness me. Well, thank so, you for your service to our country. But but even so, you think there are some young people who, who just have it all already and perhaps the, the military can't... Well, there are some things the military will would undoubtedly add, but, I mean, national service doesn't seem to me to, to be something you'd necessarily advocate. I, I wouldn't, simply because I saw it. Certainly in the latter part of my service within the cadet, where you had cadets coming in who had everything they parents were giving them 400 pounds to go away for two weeks mm. but on the other end of that there were other parents that gave kids five pounds to go away for two weeks because they just didn't have the money yes, yes. And that's the difference between you know parents want to give the kids the best they've got some kids that came to the cadets had designer kit they had top of the range trainers top of the range track suits and things like that and then you had the other kids who had, were single parents or something like that, who came along and, and they were clothed from charity shops where you had the lime green tracksuits and the daps that you used to get. Um, so that was the difference. So I think if you put these kids that are from a wealthy family or a well-off family or well-to-do family into an environment like the military, they just wouldn't hack it. Okay. Because mum's not there to make their bed. And well, them. indeed, on the... On the and the, the military is, is there to, to try, well, it needs people who are willing to be there as well, which is part of it as well. Colin, thank you very, very much indeed. Richard on Twitter says, uh, one year minimum sentence for carrying a knife, no exceptions. Then discretion of the court to increase that sentence based on circumstances. Thomas on Twitter says, Harry is becoming like Edward VIII, initially a celebrity and important. People met him. Then he lost his favour as people realised he was no longer in with the royals. By the end, they were short of money, lonely and isolated. We'll see what happens. Uh, there's certainly people who've made comparisons between Mrs. Simpson and uh, Meghan. Um, thank you to uh, Leighton, who says, I love the show as always. I totally agree with your caller, Rob. I do too, Leighton. Uh, we have to go back to basics. Parents should have responsibility for their children. Alison in Suffolk says, Morning, Peter. Great show. Listening to Rupert talking to you about Harry and Meghan, they went to a premiere of a film of someone who Harry knew very well. They're invited by the CEO of Paramount Pictures. Isn't it time to start leaving them alone now? We need to concentrate on the good work all the royals do and not the tittle-tattle and nastiness, says Alison in Suffolk. Uh, one person says, took the words right out of my mouth, Peter. It would teach them respect and discipline, much needed in today's society. Talking about young people in national service rather than Harry and Meghan, must be said. And thank you to Steve, he says, Peter, first class show, you cover all that matters. Well, thank you very much indeed. One thing I think that definitely matters that we should talk about is uh, Rishi Sunak's condemnation of the horrific irony of the Israel genocide ruling. This is at an international court. We'll be talking about that with Jake Wallace Simmons because what is happening and continues to happen in the Middle East needs to be talked about. We did want to talk about the weapon of rape as well well in conflict we will talk a little bit about that a little bit about that with Jake as well we'll get all your views as well great hour coming up we've had two good ones stay with us here on talk tv this is talk tv My friends, it's Talk Today with me, Jeremy Kyle. And me, Nicola Thorpe. We're here! Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. 
criminals to using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about sport today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. A woman can become a man and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. Slick Rishi seemed intelligent, forensic, even a bit of a statesman, the type of man you trust to look after your house while you went on holiday. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of the street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. Happy Thursday. Uh, uh, we slick it, poor and timorous beastie. I've got a panic in my beastie. Keir Starmer has accused the government of failing a generation after a record number of young people were killed last year using a knife or sharp object. We need to make sure that when we say we're going to ban them, we actually do ban them. There are so many politicians now who just said my dad was a boss. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like, you're David Cameron. No, he wasn't. <laughs> Like brought to you by Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London. Very rarely meet anybody that says, you know, the thing about London is it's got a great mayor, Sadiq <laughs> Khan, brilliant guy. In the cities, there are areas where there are no vegetables. It's particularly difficult for those people to do what Mark is saying. If he comes up with this argument again, I'll sit on it. <laughs> <laughs> all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? If you're talking about multiculturalism, it's working class white boys who get put in the army. The poorest people in society are the ones who are going to be put on the front line. Something is going horribly wrong. We can do a lot better. Donald Trump didn't just win. He obliterated. This is a guy facing nearly 100 criminal charges, and yet all that's done is actually make him more popular. Trump is canny enough to know that all publicity is good publicity. I don't want a president who's been impeached. If he's able to bamboozle you, or that's the way it comes. I did my six months, I came back, nobody would touch me. I put my head down, I persisted, I carried on. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. I've asked you two questions. Should a mass stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. Look, I'm getting ready for my new primetime show on talk TV and radio, 7 o'clock Saturday night, James Whale Unleash. I don't need you coming in here, following me around with a car. I'm so sorry about this. Saturdays at 7 on talk TV. A very good afternoon. I'm Peter Cardwell. What an absolute pleasure to have your company. Thank you so much for tuning in. Whether you've been with me for the last two hours or whether you've just switched on the telly or the radio, you're very very welcome remember if you're listening on the on the uh, radio and you want to see us on the television well you can look at sky 522 virgin media 606 freeview 237 or free sat 217 you can also maybe you're watching on the telly maybe you're heading out for a bit of lunch or something or heading into town you can listen on the radio on dab online or via the talk tv app and one thing it's very useful i do it quite often i was about to watch my friend matthew hulbert who was on vanessa yesterday and then my mum rang me, and then I went on uh, Talk TV's YouTube feed. If you just type in Talk TV Live, you can go back a full 12 hours, so I could go back and see Matthew's interview with Vanessa, which I'd highly recommend watching at half past four yesterday. We're going to take some calls, texts, and tweets, of course, as many of those as we can over the next hour. We've been talking about all sorts of things. Knife crime, for example. We've been talking about, uh, about low-level crime as well, uh, things like shoplifting. Should we even call it low level or petty? It certainly feels very serious to the people who are victims of it. We'll also be talking about Rishi Sunak condemning the horrific irony of the Israeli genocide ruling. That's something that we're going to be talking about. That was the top court of the UN ruling. Israel must act to prevent genocide in Gaza. We'll talk about Evan Gershowitz. His appeal has been rejected. Uh, that is the Wall Street Journal um, reporter who's been kept prisoner by Russia completely illegally for many, many uh, days, many, many weeks and months, an absolute nightmare for his family. And we'll be talking to the chief digital editor 
editor, uh, the international chief digital editor of the Wall Street Journal about that. I want all of your calls, texts and tweets as well on any issue you want to talk about today. Maybe we've been talking about it, maybe we haven't. 0344 499 1000 is the number to call. We'll cover what you want us to cover in the next hour. Nick Dubois here between 1 and 4 and I'm back tomorrow between 10 and 1. Those numbers, 0344 499 1000. You can text me on 87222. Be sure to put the word talk in your text. You can tweet me at TalkTV or follow me at Peter Cardwell on Twitter as well. Let's spend the next hour together. D in South End has been in touch. D says, hello, Peter. I can't help thinking that respect for the police will increase if we start seeing more action, like when they said about the watch thieves in London. We don't just need a one-off film about discipline. We need to see constant action. Then we will see more confidence in them, says D from South End. Couldn't agree more, D. It needs to be consistent. It needs to be about catching criminals and all the other stuff you can leave to one side, as far as I'm uh, concerned. Uh, Keith is in West Sussex and wants to talk about crime. Keith, thank you for the call. 0344 499 1000 is the number he called. Keith, what would you like to tell me this afternoon? Yeah, I'd like to, to, to say to, to Pisa that um, crimes like shoplifting and especially knife crime, I think should be, um, I think should be um, once caught by the police, the person should be kept into a police station overnight and I think a special court should be um, a special court should be made for people with this type of crime to go through the following day, and I think they should be given corporal punishment. Um, Keith, let, let me. Let, Keith, I, I I agree with you that there should be harsh sentences and harsh punishment for those people. But what happens if there's a 14 year old and he he or she nicks a Mars bar? and the police left them. Should they should they go through that whole process? Or should they just be told, actually, hold on, don't ever do that again. We don't want to ever see you again, Sonny. Well, no, if, 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 that, if that is the case, I mean, obviously, the, the, the police station could say, we'll give them a little telling off. That, a miles bar, we're not talking about that. We're talking about these serial, serial shoplifters. Uh, people going, if, if a person knows that if they go out with a knife and they get caught, they're going to be taken to a court and they're going to get three, five, six, strokes of the birch now i think they'll think you, you, you'd bring back you bring back corporal punishment would you i bring back the birch yes okay i mean we outlawed that a, a long a long time ago why do you think we should we should bring that back when do i think you should do it i think no no why why what what what, what deterrent do you think it would be i think it'd be a major deterrent because at the moment people carrying a knife can carry a knife and be caught five times before they go to prison a person shoplifting 100 times doesn't go to prison. If, if you stop them, say even a 13-year-old with a knife, it gets two strokes with a birch. That's going to put him off doing it in future. You, you've got to have some f f fire with fire. These people don't respect the law. They don't respect anybody. They might respect fear. They might respect going out, doing something with a knife or claiming to go out shoplifting. They're going to get caught and they're going to get punished severely. Might put them in hospital for a week, but they won't do it again. But I don't want to put people in hospital for a week, and I don't like societies like Saudi Arabia, for example, who do that sort of thing, and, I mean, they do much harsher things than what you're advocating. But surely, as a civilised society, we shouldn't be doing that. Well, we're not civilised, are we? It's a fair point. We've got people, we've got people running wild in the yeah. streets. I think a lot of we've people would thugs. agree with you, Malcolm. We've yeah. we got, we got folks doing the most deplorable things. We've got gangs going into shops literally just robbing the shop blind and what's happening nothing that'd be desperate times call for desperate measures thank you very much indeed that's keith in west sussex there um, i want to talk about another story now this is a very interesting one this is uh, the un run international court of justice it has now said that israel must face trial over possible genocide, stop short of issuing an order for them to stop the war in Gaza. Frankly, I think Israel would uh, tell them to do one. Its panel of 17 judges demanded Israel take measures to prevent and punish any acts of genocide in the enclave and provide more basic services to humanitarian aid to Palestinians. Let's talk to Rabbi Jonathan Romain, who's in uh, Maidenhead Synagogue. Uh, Jonathan, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. I really appreciate it. What do you make of this ruling against Israel? I, I, to be honest, I find it a little bit, uh, a little bit predictable. 
Uh, yes, I'm not sure if it's against Israel. What it's doing is advising Israel to make sure that the current war, in which civilians always get, always suffer, it's always the innocents, unfortunately, whether it's in Ukraine or, or Israel, Gaza or wherever, to make sure that, they, that genocide doesn't happen. What they didn't say is that it is happening, and they didn't say uh, that Israel is committing genocide. Um, and I think that's correct, because although the civilian casualties are horrific, I mean, there's no doubt about that, uh, that's what happens in war, and I think the two important things to remember are, number one, this wasn't something initiated by the Israel, uh, it was initiated by Hamas. On Absolutely, October. Those, those terrorist attacks on the 7th of October. Some of these 17 yeah. judges come from Russia and China, have they any, any right to uh, lecture Israel about anything? Well, I don't want to question the validity of the court because, you know, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, but the other thing I'm is... I'm not a lawyer I... either, but I, I'm not going to take any lectures from anybody from Russia and China. But sorry, say what you're going to say, Jonathan. Uh, no, I was just going to sort of point out that, of course, Israel's in a very difficult position because I think on the one hand it has the right to defend itself um, against further attacks because Hamas has not even just said sorry, it's kept the hostages... So it hasn't released them. And what's more, it said it will do October the 7th again and again as much as it can. So Israel really doesn't have any alternative but to try and destroy Hamas. And, and that's the important thing. They're attacking Hamas, not the Palestinians. It's just unfortunate, really, really unfortunate, that Hamas's tactic has been to embed itself in civilian areas, under schools, under mosques. I mean, it's quite horrendous, really. Well, Hamas, uh, Hamas, Hamas wants a large death toll because they want to use it for propaganda purposes. They are not defending their own people. Well, well, are they even their own people? That's another major issue. With the UN itself as well, I mean, its refugee agency is not... They're now investigating various people who may have been members of Hamas or who were cheering Hamas when they perpetrated the horrendous terrorist attacks against Israel on the 7th of October. So, look, the UN is not one, you know, homogenous organisation. It's many, many different things. But this ICJ is, the, is, is part of the UN. And if the UN's doing one thing with one, one arm of it and saying, Israel, you're terrible, and then the other side uh, with its, some of its members, allegedly, of the Refugee uh, Association, Refugee Agency, well, that's something I think that a lot of people in Israel will presumably find quite tough to take. Uh, yes, they will. You're quite right. And the UN and Israel have always had a bit of a dodgy relationship. But I think we have to judge Israel by our own moral standards. And, and I suppose, yes, on the one hand, it's horrendous uh, civilian casualties. But I suppose you can also, I think, point out that Israel has tried to avoid them. Like it's always a, a warned people in advance. I mean, Russia's never uh, warned Ukrainians we're going to send a missile attack to the local station. Hamas certainly didn't, didn't warn those people that uh, took hostage. It certainly didn't war warn those people. I've spoken to relatives of people who were murdered during the 7th of October terrorist attacks as well. Yes. So, um, you know, uh, there, there are rules of war, um, even though it sounds a bit odd because in war, war involves bloodshed and death. death. Um, but, but Israel has tried to minimise casualties. Unfortunately, that hasn't happened. And uh, what the International Court of Justice is saying, please try. And it hasn't said stop the fighting. It's tried to say fight in a different way to minimise casualties. Mm. Well, I would agree with that. Um, and unfortunately, I think Israel's got very little alternative but to try and, A, get rid of Hamas, uh, not the Palestinians, but Hamas, uh, and B, try and get the hostages back. And I think if anyone captured your mother or my mother or son or daughter or whatever, we would want to get them back. I totally agree with you, and we did want to talk a bit earlier to Nim Kowali. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to get hold of her, but how Hamas has used rape as a weapon of war and this horrendous attacks on some of the uh, hostages who are not just being held, but also had uh, rape used against them. It, it's absolutely horrendous. Uh, we need those hostages back in Israel and with their families. There's so much in this conflict that is very, very difficult as well, uh, Jonathan. And certainly Israel has been through a lot over the past couple of months. There are people, of course, who will say they could have done things differently. I certainly am not defending all the actions of its military or indeed Benjamin Netanyahu. But everybody in Israel today will be thinking about the fact that it is Holocaust Memorial Day. I know you will too. Uh, you've been, um, presumably, this morning uh, at, your, at your synagogue. Uh, Jonathan, what message were you giving to your uh, congregation today? Yes, now speaking not just as a rabbi, but actually the child of a survivor, because my mother left or fled Germany in August 1939, just a few weeks before war broke out. On the Kinders transport, she was uh, an 11-year-old, and we've been eternally grateful to Britain ever since for taking in the 10,000 children. And frankly, if they hadn't, 
uh, she would have ended up in Auschwitz or Bergen-Belsen, and I wouldn't be here talking to you. And, um, you know, the great cry that came out in 1945, never again, well, it's a righteous cry, but unfortunately it hasn't really been observed, and we can think of other uh, mini holocausts, if you like, that have happened all over the world, whether it was in Cambodia with Pol Pot or Darfur or the Rohingyas um, uh, or um, uh, Rwanda. Uh, and, and the world, unfortunately, does need that constant reminder. And, 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 and the sadness, going back to uh, what happened with Hamas, is it wasn't that they just attacked Israel, because frankly they've done that before, or Hezbollah's done that, but it was the way in which they did that, as you alluded to, you know, raping women, cutting off their body parts, uh, massacring, uh, killing children, uh, babies, I mean, smashing babies against the rock. I mean, these were not just killing, they were brutal. Um, and, and you just wonder about the mindset behind such brutal killings. And they were deliberately killing civilians, not attacking military units. And again, the, the hatred, the raw hatred that lay behind the October 7th attack is what I think has galvanized Israel to say in its own way, never again, we're not going to allow Hamas uh, to regroup. Um, and yes, there was a ceasefire, and that was October the 6th, and Hamas had broken yeah. the ceasefire. Yeah, totally, truly correct. I, have you seen the film One Life about Nicholas Wint Wint Winton? Uh, yes, I have, and I knew Nicky Winton very well. Did you? Wow. He lived up from me. He was a neighbour, a good friend. Good. Oh, yes, of course, you're in Maidenhead. That's right. Yes, he lived yeah. there. Uh, this is an amazing film. Just for anybody who hasn't seen it or hasn't heard about it, um, this man, uh, you talked about the kinder transport, your mother coming over and that. He set up his own, uh, along with many other people, uh, I, I, he got many, many uh, Czechoslovakian children. It was, of course, one country then, Czechoslovakia. Out of uh, that, out of Czechoslovakia, just before the Nazis arrived. It's a very, very moving film, isn't it? As someone who who knew him, Jonathan, uh, what was it like to see it portrayed on screen? Uh, very moving, uh, and I have to say that Anthony Hopkins was astonishingly good. Wasn't he I mean, brilliant? He, he was, and, and so good that Nicky Winton's son, uh, also called Nicholas, as it happens, said that when he was watching the film, he sometimes thought he was watching his father, <laughs> an actor. Which, Goodness me. Uh, if people uh, watching uh, talk TV or listening to you now haven't seen it, it's really worth it. It's a heroic story about how a lot of people just tut tutted or said, oh, how awful, but did nothing and turned the page. Um, uh, but he actually got up and did something, and he saved uh, 669 children, uh, and their descendants are a number about 4,000 now. So just an ordinary bloke who just got up and got active, and it just it was a really good example to us. And in fact, if he was alive today, I know exactly what he would say. He would say, don't talk about me, don't talk about history, uh, think about yourselves and what you yourself can do at this moment. To me, there's a scene at the end of the film. There are many moving scenes throughout the film. I cried a number of times, um, certainly when, when, especially when, when parents were you know, on the trains going away from their parents and their parents were, by implication, probably going to go to the camps and to be murdered by the Nazis. There was a f but there was one scene at the very, very end, Jonathan, where some of the survivors, some of the children that he brought out of Czechoslovakia are having a swim in his uh, swimming pool. And there was a, uh, he spoke to this young girl who said she, uh, many years ago he liked swimming. Then she was back and swimming in his pool. And you saw all the people, like you, Jonathan, all the people who survived, who were there because of Nicholas Winton, because of the kinder transport, because there were very, very brave people back then. And you saw all the people laughing, enjoying themselves, doing what families should do. And to me, that was just, it's not just about the people he rescued, it's about the many thousands of people who are alive today because of the bravery of people like him. Yes, and that was a brilliant ending because it just emphasised he was an ordinary bloke and he liked nothing better than uh, having a swim with his grandchildren and his friends. Um, and it wasn't like a, you know, he was in an Olympic stadium receiving a gold medal or public acclaim. He just wanted to get on with the rest of his life. Um, and it shows that if he can do it, then so can you and I. Thank you so much, Jonathan. I appreciate you speaking to us today. That's uh, Rabbi Jonathan Romain, who is at the Maidenhead Synagogue. It's made that connection, actually, of course. Nicky Winton was, was living in, in Maidenhead. Thank you so much to everybody who's been in touch, including Alan and Redding in Berkshire. He says, hi, Peter, I find it an absolute disgrace that South Africa brings a case of genocide against Israel. May I direct you to the YouTube White Genocide in South Africa, where over a 1,000 white farmers and families were butchered, lands confiscated, their possessions and assets taken by the South African government because they were white, denied their human rights and the brutality covered up. What happened? 
happened in Rwanda is happening in South Africa at the moment. That is happening. I have plenty of friends in South Africa. I lived there for a short time on my gap ya for about six months. I have pl plenty of connections and Alan is absolutely right. It is a disgrace and the South African government has a lot of questions to answer. There are many, many good things that came out of the end of apartheid. Of course they did. It had to end. It was a horrendous racist system that should have ended. The government that is there now, which is, uh, let me see, 20 years later? Yes, 20 years later. Um, is no, th hold on, uh, yes, 30 years later, apologies, basic mathematics fails me, 30 years on from the end of apartheid is in many ways racist and needs to be called out, so thank you Alan for mentioning that. ICJ ruling, oh please, it's a war, do you really think soldiers listen to paper pushers? No, I don't, I don't think the Israeli government are going to listen to the ICJ either. Uh, quite a few people getting in touch on the death penalty as well, Mr. Ang and, and the Birch as well. The Birch didn't work for Mad Frankie Fraser, says one person. Yes, bring back the Birch, it works, says David at Kingston upon Hull. And uh, Mr. Angry in Huddersfield says, the death penalty would be a deterrent to carrying knives. It would stop and make people think about the risk of someone dying. I'm not sure I agree with you, Mr. Ang uh, Mr. Angry. I'm against the death penalty because I don't think it deters people. I think there are many people who carry knives who could die at any moment because they live in a world where people could stab them, uh, where they could be in a fight where something goes wrong and they get stabbed. They carry the knife um, because, yeah, I mean, they're bad people and shouldn't carry knives. No one should carry a knife. In terms of the very dangerous life they lead, is the death penalty really going to put them off when they deal with life and death every single day? They know people who are dead, they've maybe killed people themselves. They've seen people die in horrific ways, which are not the very sanitary ways in which people die if you had the death penalty, for example, an injection in the arm or something like that. That's a much more straightforward and, I don't want to say the word nice, but certainly reasonable, humane way to die, even though I don't support it. That is a much less dramatic death than being stabbed with a knife, and that is the that is the life that people lead often who carry li knives or are in gangs. You may disagree with me. That's okay. There's 30, 38 minutes in which to do so before Nick Dubois comes on. 0344 499 1000. We'll take more calls after the break. We'll also talk about Evan Gershevitz, who has been detained by Russia. Absolutely horrendous that that is happening. And we'll talk to one of his colleagues at the Wall Street Journal. Stay with us here at Talk TV. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And you're on your smart speaker. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. A woman can become a man and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. Slick Rishi seemed intelligent, forensic, even a bit of a statesman, the type of man you trust to look after your house while you went on holiday. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. Happy Thursday. Um, uh, we slick it, cool and timorous beastie. Open a panic in my beastie. Keir Starmer has accused the government of failing a generation after a record number of young people were killed last year using a knife or sharp object. We need to make sure that when we say we're going to ban them, we actually do ban them. There are so many politicians now who just said my dad was a boss. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like, you're David Cameron. No, he wasn't. <laughs> Like brought to you by Sadiq Khan, the Mayor of London. Very rarely meet anybody that says, you know, the thing about London is it's got a great mayor, <laughs> Sadiq Khan, brilliant guy. In the cities, there are areas where there are no vegetables. It's particularly difficult for those people to do what Mark is saying. If he comes up with this argument again, I'll sit on it. <laughs> <laughs> all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? If you're talking about multiculturalism, it's working class white boys who get put in the army. The poorest people in society are the ones who are going to be put on the front line. Something is going horribly wrong. We can do a lot better. Donald Trump didn't just win. He obliterated. This is a guy facing nearly 100 criminal charges, and yet all that's done is actually make him more popular. Trump is canny enough to know that all publicity is good publicity. I don't want a president who's been impeached. If he's able to bamboozle you, that's the way it goes. 
I did my six months, I came back, nobody would touch me. I put my head down, I persisted, I carried on. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. I've asked you two questions. Should a mass stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Thank you to Sally and Surrey who's been in touch about One Life, which is this film about Nicholas Winton. He's the man who uh, spearheaded efforts to get nearly 700 children out of Czechoslovakia. It's brilliant, brilliant. And, and just as the war was about to start, just as Czechoslovakia was about to be invaded by the Nazis. Sally and Surrey says, Peter, I saw One Life yesterday. It was astonishingly brilliant. It made me realise that while most people are good, every now and then there's a special person who is much more than good, a person who actually changes lives or saves lives of other people who are strangers. Easily the most moving film I've seen for a very long time. Love from Sally and Surrey. Sally, I, I promise you, even just thinking about it, talking about it to Rabbi Jonathan, I had the the, the um, goosebumps in the back of my neck. It was just uh, hairs in the back of my neck and, and goosebumps. It was just a, a really moving film. I saw it last uh, week with my friend Kathy, and Kathy's father actually uh, escaped uh, as, a, as an infant, as a two-year-old, I think. Um, escaped Nazi Germany as well, escaped the Nazis, and uh, is alive today, as is Kathy, as is her family. And it was just, it was a lovely, um, a lovely film to see. And I think, I think everybody should see it. It's called One Life, and it's in the cinemas now. Well worth it, especially because today is Holocaust Memorial Day. We're going to be talking to a, uh, a Holocaust survivor actually tomorrow. There are very few of them still left because of the passage of time, of course. But uh, we'll be talking to a Holocaust survivor tomorrow. One thing where there is obviously still a huge amount of international media focus is Ukraine. And uh, we know there are horrendous human rights abuses there as well. And we remember those, of course, today, uh, uh, which is Holocaust Memorial Day. We need to remember not just what happened 70 years ago, more than 70 years ago now, but what is happening in this country. Um, uh, well, sorry, in this world, I should say, not in this country, thankfully, but in this world. Uh, there are horrendous human rights abuses in so many different places. Ukraine is one of them. Um, the Middle East is another. And every day here at um, this, in this building I walk in and there are a bank of screens and on the screens there is uh, a hashtag, I stand with Evan, and there's a picture of Evan Gershevitz who is a Wall Street Journal reporter and he is being detained by Russia at the moment. The American embassy in Moscow sent out a tweet on Friday saying journalism is not a crime. We continue to call for Evan's immediate release. He was reporting on, excuse me, on uh, Ukraine. But Russia has once again extended the pre-trial detention of Evan Gershevitz. He's only 32. He was arrested last year on espionage charges. The court ordered his detention will be extended until the end of March, 30th of March which means he will have spent, have spent over one year behind bars as he awaits trial. This is absolutely disgraceful. Well, one of his colleagues is Gronya McCarthy. She is chief digital editor of the uh, chief digital editor international of the Wall Street Journal, which is part of the same group that owns uh, Talk TV. We're owned by News UK, and uh, it's it's a its parent company, News Corp owns the Wall Street Journal. And Gronya is with me now. Gronya, thank you very much indeed for joining me on Hi. Talk TV. How are you? Hi, Peter. Good, thank you. Thanks for having me. It is just horrendous what is happening to Evan. Just bring us up to date with everything that's happening. And it's, it stops me in my tracks every morning when I come into the news building in London and see those bank of screens, and I sometimes just stop and look at him. Um, so, yeah, as you mentioned, yesterday morning, uh, it was 6 a.m. London time, um, there was another hearing in uh, the court in La Forteva, which is uh, affiliated with the prison where he is. Um, we got a glimpse of Evan coming out of the courtroom. Um, after about an hour of the you know proceedings inside, it was a closed door hearing, and the court, uh, the judge, um, you know, uh, accepted the request by investigators, Russian investigators, to extend Evans' pre pre-trial detention until the end of March. So, as you say, he, if the, if if nothing else changes in his circumstances between now and then, he will have spent a full year in prison. He turned 32 in October, so he's already had a birthday in prison. He has spent the holiday season in prison. He has spent New Year in prison. Um, it's been it's been 300 days now. It's been just over 300 days that he is behind bars. 
literally for doing his job. And we know Evan well in London. Evan was actually living in Shoreditch in London, and he was going back and forth into Moscow um, since the war in Ukraine happened. So he's very dear to us um, at the Wall Street Journal, obviously, but also very particularly in the London newsroom. How, so we're trying to remain as active as possible on his behalf. Of course, and keeping keeping uh, it in the news. And, and I know the Times newspaper mentions him every day. They have a little graphic that reminds us how his illegal, how long his illegal detention has been. We appreciate that. Uh, and we, of course, here at Talk TV stand completely shoulder to shoulder with our colleagues at the Wall Street Journal. Um, how will you know Evan? How will he be coping with this, Gronje? How will he be dealing with this? Because we've seen some pictures of him. Um, I mean, you will know what he looked like before, but certainly he, he, it doesn't look as if. I mean, he, he seems pale to me. He seems thinner than he is in other photographs. What what about his welfare? What do we know about that? I mean, he's he's just an inspiration to all of us. He is incredibly resilient. Um, he, you know, he has, you know, like there, there are no silver linings really in this kind of scenario, but he knows Russia well. He's been he's an incredible reporter and he, um, you know, he grew up in a family. Uh, his parents were Jewish emigres to the United States uh, from the Soviet Union. He grew up speaking Russian. He's steeped in Russian culture. And it's because of his interest in Russia that he actually went there and started reporting in Russia um, for the Moscow Times and for um, AFP before he joined the journal in January 2022. So he's actually covered stories of, you know, he covered the Brittany Griner story. She was an NBA basketball player who was arrested in Russia and was eventually swapped um, in a deal between the US government and the Russian government. So he sort of knows the playbook, um, which I think is maybe helping him to sort of understand the situation that he's in. He's um, He's just resilient. He's uh, he's trying to stay healthy. He's doing a lot of meditating. He's reading a lot. He's he's in a very small cell, but he's somehow managing to work out. So um, and even yesterday morning when we saw him coming out in the snowy Moscow, minus five degrees, he was coming out of the of the court and you know with in handcuffs and mm. he was still sp smiling. He smiled at a cameraman who like said something to him. So um, I, I know his family, his family are amazing and it's just such a difficult situation for them. But somehow he is giving us strength to sort of keep going mm. um, because he is remaining strong. What's it like for you and your colleagues in the newsroom, Grania? You're not just colleagues of Evans, you're a friend of his as well. It's hard. It's really hard. And on days like yesterday, I mean, I was, you know, up at, you know, crack of dawn because we wanted to see him and see what was going on. And it's, uh, it catches me every time. And as I say, sometimes when I walk into our building and I see those screens of Evan, it just stops me in my tracks. But um, we have to keep going. Uh, you know, he, we, we need Evan to be released. We need Evan to come home. And we are confident that will happen. But it's just, you know, well, what do you think will happen? days are really Gronje? hard. What, what, what do you think will happen, Gronje? Because there have been efforts, of course. He, uh, he's an American citizen. The American embassy has been... Uh, trying very, very hard in this, but it has been a long time, and he still even hasn't even got to trial yet for of, for ridiculous charges. I mean, I think the honest answer is we don't 100% know yeah. how this is going to play out and under what timeline. But you know, um, President Biden has met Evan's family. Um, the U.S. government really. I mean, Evan is an American citizen, born and raised in the United States. Um, the U.S. government is in the kind of driver's seat here, um, and President Biden has said he has, he's promised Evan's parents that he will bring Evan home, mm -hmm. and we have to we have to have faith in that. That the, the government, um, we recent we and others recently reported that the U.S. government had made an offer, a proposal to swap Evan and Paul Whelan, who was also wrongfully detained in Russia, an American citizen also. Um, he, they had made a proposal to the Russian government, but it wasn't accepted. Uh, President Putin, um, at his press conference um, before Christmas, actually took a question on Evan and it seemed to suggest that there, you know, there there were conversations. So we have to have faith in that. We want Evan to, to come home as soon as possible. Uh, the Russian government continues to say there needs to be a trial. We you know, obviously, we don't want that to happen, but. You know, we just don't know how it's going to pan, pan out, but we expect him to come home eventually. Um, so it's hard. It's really hard. Gronny, you're doing great work. Um, listen, if I was in that situation, I would be delighted to have you as my friend and my advocate. Um, if you see me in the canteen in this building, tap me on the shoulder, I'll buy you a cup of tea because I just think 
you're, you're really flying the flag for Evan. You're giving him a huge amount of support, and we stand shoulder to shoulder with you, as does everybody in this building and in this company right Thank around you. the we world. Thank really you. We really appreciate that, and it really is the least we can do. Thank you. Thank you, Grania. That's Grania McCarthy there. He's the Chief Digital Editor International for the Wall Street Journal. They have an office, of course, here in London as well, where Grania works. And indeed, Evan, as she mentioned there, Evan Gershowitz, uh, his, whose appeal has been rejected, uh, he uh, had worked in this building as well. Uh, thank you to so many people who've been in touch. Tamsin says, I never, agreed with, I never agree with state-sanctioned murder. I do agree with the caller about bringing back the birch. I'm all for branding rapists and paedophiles too. Branding rapists and paedophiles? Sorry, I don't want to do that. Um, I threw them in prison, yes. Um, you know, branding, I'm sorry, that, that's barbaric. Uh, quick, painful and low cost to the taxpayer. Sorry, Tamsin, disagree with you on that one, but thank you for your message nonetheless. Ian in York has been in touch. He said, I find this international court ruling absolute nonsense. By what right morally do these pompous, self-righteous idiots feel they can rule in the juggernaut of these hostilities. It sounds like it sounds and feels like giving a slap on the wrist and a stern wagging finger into putting Napoleon Hitler's face. They'd laugh and walk away, says Ian in York. Um, Ian very much on the side of Israel in that, uh, in that debate. Um, Ian, I, I know what you mean. I mean, the International Court of Justice, uh, UN building, I mean, I don't know. I just, I just think, you know, the re there are members of the, well, I do know, there are members of the refugee agency who are, are suspected of being members of Hamas as well, of cheering when Hamas terrorists uh, attacked and murdered Israeli citizens. There are Russian and Chinese judges on this court and we're meant to take them seriously. I'm afraid I don't, quite frankly. John is in Norfolk, um, has given me a ring on 0344 499 1000. John, you're very welcome to the programme. Uh, you're an ex-Teddy Boy gang member, apparently. Is that right, John? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Go ahead. Well, will you give me 60 seconds preamble? Go for it. Because I feel extremely passionate about my country. I'm 86 in June. My preschool days were spent sitting in an air raid shelter in London. Right? OK. I got bombed. A house got bombed. I got the scars on my body to prove where the shrapnel hit me. So, But it never frightened me. It never turned me into a nut. I just didn't know what was going on. Right. So I turned into a teen. I was one of the lucky boys. I passed the 11 plus. My dad didn't even know what the 11 plus was. So, Teddy Boys. Ever heard of Teddy Boys? I've certainly heard of the Teddy Boys, but, but tell me more. Well, I was one of the first. I've been on the front page of the press. Right. They I'm going to issue you that. Know, I'm building up to something, so I'm just trying to give you an example of what sort of from a boy to a man, Go how for society it. affected me. Go for it. So we became a teddy boy. Now, Saturday night, we went, 60 or 70 of us, on Slough Station, train station, to go to Reading. And there we were. 90% of us had a flick knife or a kosh in our pockets. Well, sorry, I don't know what a kosh is. I should know, but I don't know. It's What's a, a kosh? Well, imagine I'll get better than a piece of wood, six inches long. Right. Inch diameter, yeah, with a piece of with a piece of lead tied round the end. You don't want to be at the business end of that, really, do you? And that was carried by most of us. Okay, so what happened every next? Time, every time we departed up to Reading, there was a policeman on the beat, policeman there. We were never any trouble, but the moment we'd had a few beers, things changed, mm -hmm. and it was always punch-ups. But never knives. I had several friends sent to... There was Borstals then, mm -hmm. and they were sent to Borstal. But then I started to watch things. There was always a policeman on the beat, always. And whenever he was around, we were quiet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can remember in the late 50s in Tottenham, the policeman on the beat, it was decided it wasn't safe for him to be on his own. They had to put two. You don't know that. You've never heard of that, have you? I, I, well, I've, I've heard of it, certainly. But tell, but, tell me, but tell me what happened on the, on the platform. Is that the story you're telling me? Well, we, we would stand there and suddenly the press turned up. And I do remember being interviewed. But then a fight started. For some reason, somebody objected to him interviewing us. OK. And it, it was a hell of a punch-up. But still nobody stabbed. And that was all settled. Then we started going about our ways. Then I started noticing. I used to use London, commute to London, the jazz clubs. 
Florida and the Flamingo in Wardour oh, okay. Street. Okay, I, I just need to bring... John, tell me, tell me the end of the story. Right. We watch areas turn into no-go areas. Mm -hmm. We don't go there. There's too many of these. And then it got worse. And the police never did anything. Then the fight started. Brixton, oh, I can name you areas where there's no... I've got, I'm not black. I've got black friends. You don't go there. There's too many black people. And the fighting started and the stab. I watched it start. You don't go... You're frightened. Now, I live in a village. I'm going out tonight. And I'm getting a taxi home because I'm frightened to walk home. Because we have got immigrants here. And they walk about and they are different to us. They not spit at us. It's not, it's not just immigrants who are, who are, criminal, who are criminals, though. Some immigrants no, are criminals. Not. Some people from here are criminals. No, it's not. It's not. It's not. But once upon a time, my wife and I used to walk this every night. Walk it. You just don't feel safe now, anymore, John? No, no, I don't. I don't. I'm looking out my window. I've got a fir tree, green grass, acre of grass, and it's beautiful. But half a mile further on is the town. You can't go there at night. What has society done? What has society done? It has failed us. And it will not, Peter, it will not get better. John. It will not get better. Okay. You're going to have your program about people being stabbed, but we have failed. If there was a government strong enough to stop this, they could. It would take 10 years, but they would stop it. OK, John, thanks very much indeed for your thoughts there. Let's go to Denise in Nottingham. I think knife crime is what you want to talk about as well, Denise. Well, hi, yes. Um, it's just a quick one, really. I've been listening to the programme for the last um, few hours. Excellent, thank and, you. Um, there was an incident... Um, that I was, um, I was visiting Tottenham, funny enough, and um, they'd gone on for an event and um, there's some, they was on the top of the bus and there was something going off and the bus kept stopping when it wasn't a bus stop. This was in and London? Then, this was in, in Tottenham, in you said? Yeah. OK. So anyway, um, what happened, um, there was two buses, they were like one at the front, one at the back, and we were on the middle one. Anyway, the police came on the bus, took a boy off the bus um, and um, passed him down and he had a, a machete down his leg and his training. Uh, a machete, a machete. Yeah, a, a huge big knife, yeah. right? Okay. So what yeah. happened then? So anyway, they took him, arrested him, and everything. So obviously, I was talking to my friends. Came back to Nottingham, and um, I thought, you know, telling my friends, and I said, oh, we'll try and get one. Do you know what I mean? So anyway, I went online. First place I went on was Amazon. Why, why did you do I, that, I, um, uh, Denise? Because I, I, to me, I just I've never seen them in the shops. I didn't know. You know, we were just having a conversation. Do you know what I mean about the incident with the group? So you just wanted to see how how you, uh, how uh, it, where, where it was available, sort of thing. How much they cost, yes, that sort of thing. Yes, exactly. So anyway, I used my friend's um, um, grandson's credit card. He was under sixteen. Um, debit card, sorry. And um, what is it? So I went on Amazon, asked loads of questions. So I just left that. And then I went on a, 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 um, a company called, on the internet called um, OnBuy, and I ordered a masher over three foot. Do you know what I mean? It came within three days. So, so you, you actually that. ordered and paid for one of these knives. Why did, why did you do yes. I mean, why did you do that, Tony? I just wanted to see how easy it was. Okay. Um, for them, you know, because obviously this was about a year ago, and you know, blah blah blah, whatever. Anyway, my point being is that, um, so I called the police and I said, Oh, I've just ordered this, and the police in Nottingham, I've ordered this um, thing from whatever, from um, this company, you know, and I've just been watching about the knife crime and everything, and how easy yeah. it is to get hold of the knife, and I've not asked for no idea or nothing like that, you know, and they said, Oh, that's nothing to do with us, you have to go to the company that you went to. So, hold, so on, said, hold, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. So, Denise, you, you bought a machete online. Mm -hmm. It was delivered to your house. You went to the place. This is really easy to do. This is, yep. this is just a transaction. These are supposedly outlawed. You told the police about mm -hmm. this company that has been selling them online and the police says nothing mm -hmm. to do with us. Yes. And so it's Shocking. Not you. you have to go back to the company. You have to go back to the company. I told them what company. Now, this company uses lots of different people. Yes, so different names company. and yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly, you know, and the only way to contact them is actually to send a message if you want to return it or if there's a yeah. fault. And I did that, nobody got back to me. Now, fair enough, it's all right for grass. I did ask, where, where could I get rid of it? Because I don't need it. Do you know yeah. what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, 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 so, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I just wanted to see because 
obviously the children nowadays, like our lady was saying earlier on today, there is nowhere for them to go. There's no clubs, there's no parks, so everything is shut down. And what is available costs money. And the parents haven't got money. Do you know what I mean? Because most parents are either working two jobs because the single parent or something's happened in their life or, you know, that they can't afford to get the children to go anywhere. And do the children want to go anywhere? Because they're boring. Everything's boring. Do you know what I mean? So they stay in and watch all these horrible games to play and films to watch. You know, yeah, that I know all. what you mean. And some, some, of those are very, some of those are very violent themselves, uh, Denise. Thank you very much. Extraordinary story there. Thank you very much indeed to Denise in Nottingham. We heard from John as well. We'll take more of your calls. And we'll talk to Tech Up Dave about something nice that's going to put a smile on her face, which is Cat of the Week. That will happen in just a few minutes here on Talk TV. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. A woman can become a man and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. Slick Rishi seemed intelligent, forensic, even a bit of a statesman, the type of man you trust to look after your house while you went on holiday. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. Happy Thursday. Um, uh, we slick it, poor and timorous beastie. Open a panic in thy beastie. Keir Starmer has accused the government of failing a generation after a record number of young people were killed last year using a knife or sharp object. We need to make sure that when we say we're going to ban them, we actually do ban them. There are so many politicians now who just said, my dad was a boss. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're David Cameron. No, he wasn't. <laughs> Like brought to you by Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London. Very rarely meet anybody that says, you know, the thing about London is it's got a great mayor, <laughs> Sadiq Khan, brilliant guy. In the cities, there are areas where there are no vegetables. It's particularly difficult for those people to do what Mark is saying. If he comes up with this argument again, I'll sit on it. <laughs> <laughs> all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? If you're talking about multiculturalism, it's working class white boys who get put in the army. The poorest people in society are the ones who are going to be put on the front line. Something is going horribly wrong. We can do a lot better. Donald Trump didn't just win. He obliterated. This is a guy facing nearly 100 criminal charges, and yet all that's done is actually make him more popular. Trump is canny enough to know that all publicity is good publicity. I don't want a president who's been impeached. If he's able to bamboozle you, or that's the way it goes. I did my six months, I came back, nobody would touch me. I put my head down, I persisted, I carried on. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. I've asked you two questions. Should a mass stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. Tech up Dave, the man, the legend, is in the studio. Hello, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I think to about you. that for a moment. <laughs> it is. It is the afternoon. Well, it's always the afternoon when you're on. So all you have to do is remember to say afternoon. We've had a big reaction to your glasses as well. Have we? I think are very nice. Yes. My uh, daughter saw me for the first time on the telly wearing them. And what did she say? Well, she said they were very nice. I got a text message saying, I've just seen you on the oh, telly. that's nice. I thought that was quite cool. That's very nice. Um, well, listen, uh, enough about uh, Dave's eyewear. Let's do Cat of the Week. <laughs> It's Cardi B's Cat of the Week. 
Now then, Dave, Suzanne Preston emailed us with the cat of the week. Tell yes. us about her cat. Uh, her, her cat is called Albie and a uh, big fan of Talk TV, as you will see in the pictures that uh, we're going Excellent. to show on the telly and you're going to tweet. I'm going to tweet them a bit later on, but he's watching uh, Talk TV uh, at one, in one of the photos. He looks like a in lovely, two of lovely them, cat. Actually. Yeah, he's, he's a uh, rescue. We think yes. his owner's moved house and left him behind. Goodness me, if they did that, they're a bunch of scumbags. Uh, fending for himself for a number of months before being rescued. However, their loss has certainly been uh, my gain, says Suzanne. He's a big boy, isn't he, Dave? Yeah, 6.5 kilograms. Goodness me. Uh, but such a softy. He's my shadow, says uh, Suzanne. Uh, following me everywhere. Loves a day in the office when I'm working from home. Uh, and very chatty. And... Uh, any opportunity for a cuddle, he turns up. Excellent. Well, she got what she wanted because when inquiring at her local cat rescue, she asked for a chunky monkey who likes lots of loves and is the perfect match. Uh, he's not at the best of starts, but I like to think he's now living his best life. Well, certainly it looks as if he is living his best life. Well, yeah, he's sitting there watching you on the telly. Well, I mean, what, what more <laughs> could a James cat, Whale. What more could a cat want? Um, he looks very, very happy, and I'm sure Suzanne is a wonderful cat mum. So that's Suzanne yes. Preston's cat. Albie is our cat of the week this week. And there has been cat controversy there in regard has. to Claudia Schiffer, Dave. Yes, earlier in the week you would have seen Claudia Schiffer on the red carpet of Matthew Vaughan's new spy film Argyle. And uh, she appeared on the red carpet with a backpack with Chip the cat in it. Yes, I think we can see that so picture on the screen. You if you're, if you're watching on the screen, we'll put that picture up of Claudia Schiffer. So this was like a rucksack with yeah. like a, a clear plastic dome in it with the cat's face sort of peering out. It's caused a lot of controversy. I saw it and I wasn't particularly happy with it because I think the, the cat's going to be very distressed in that situation. Look, he's a, he's a cat who can deal with a yeah. film set, so maybe, maybe it, it's different. But we've had reaction. Cats Protection says, thought the photos of Chip the cat in a bubble backpack on the red carpet at their guy premiere looked fun think again it's extremely concerning to see a cat exposed to such stressful environment while contained in an inappropriate character and Alison Richards uh, from uh, Cats Protection said though some cats may appear to tolerate backpacks backpacks the movement on a person's back is unpredictable and most lack adequate ventilation and space for the cat, leaving them cramped or uncomfortable. The large window in the bubble backpack featured also mean cats don't have the option to hide when they feel anxious, leaving them feeling exposed and vulnerable. Claudia, don't do it again. Um, I, I, I saw that. I just I just wasn't happy with that, um, to be honest. Where do you stand on cat prams, Dave? Pardon? There are some people who um, have prams for their cats. They have a little pram and they bring their cat out in a pram. Where do you stand on that? They do it for dogs as well. Uh, I'm quite shocked. Uh, why would you need a pram for your cat? Doesn't, doesn't your cat just wander off on its own? Yes, but this is so you can know where... I, I'm, I'm against cat prams. I've, my friend Lauren is completely pro them. Is but, this uh, a bit like cat in the hat? Or? I don't know. I don't know. But anyway, listen, Dave, thank you very much. Let's tech off Dave uh, with um, Cat of the Week. Uh, we will, of course, have a rescue animal of the week tomorrow as well. I want to do a couple of calls now before we go, before I talk to Nick Dubois. Judy is in Warwickshire. Uh, Judy, you're very welcome to the programme this afternoon. What would you like to say? Oh, hi, Peter. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah. Hello. Just picking up on the uh, conversations about uh, crime and antisocial behaviour yes. uh, amongst our youngsters, and I, my view is that we need a focus on uh, investment in our young people who are increasingly disaffected in our society. There is no clear transition from childhood to adulthood anymore due to lack of opportunities and investment. And uh, and I think there are a number of resolution uh, measurements that could be adopted straight away to reduce youth crime and antisocial behaviour in terms of our youngsters who are still at school. Julia, I just want to ask you something about, and you're talking about investment there. Is this all about money? Because there are lots of kids, no. uh, there's some, some people who've been in touch saying, you know, we, we had nothing as kids, and not me personally, but mm -hmm. the people who've been in touch. Um, you know, we had people saying we had very little as kids, but we knew what discipline was, we knew what family was, oh, we, knew what, we knew what we knew what we had to do in society, and we knew that if we stepped out of line, we'd be told very quickly to step back into line. That was me, similarly. I yeah. grew up on uh, a run-down council estate, and um, I took myself through college, university later on in life and um, have not, um, you know, crossed that line uh, in terms of crime, antisocial behaviour. Yes, I got up to a few shenanigans and uh, as, as, as a child, but there was always mm, uh, an investment in that, uh, you know, you would leave school, you, you knew what sort of job you were going to go into. I mean, I started life in a, in, in a factory in terms of adulthood. 
Um, uh, there were, you know, certain sort of uh, uh, expectations. Yes. Uh, kids would leave school, they'd get their first pay packet. Um, you know, if they're 18, they'd take dad or mum down the club or pub and, uh, and enjoy that, uh, that drink. But we have lost so much um, over the years. And I think, you know, we need to reinvest in our youngsters in terms of our social policy uh, and, uh, uh, and legislative measures. And I think we should be looking at job and training matching of our young people in their penultimate year at school, college or university even. Um, but I'm mainly focused on, on school and college. Mm -hmm. um, their their non-attendance should equi equate to no employment seekers allowance or benefit except for bona fide reasons whether that's health ability or a mismatch of training or, or or job options and benefits should be paid during further uh periods uh where that matching is having to be redone and there should also be targeted investment in local employers to take on and train young people. We've lost so many apprenticeship schemes and then we've lost that local investment. And, uh, and I think that needs to be a focus. Um, you know, that target investment is crucial. And in terms of all the conversation about migrants and immigrants, again, there is no reason why similar processes of job matching to skills with supervisory provisions shouldn't be considered. Um, you know, and everybody in terms of working in the care and health sector should be in a position where enhanced DBS checks can be carried out. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just so saddened that you know, we're not giving back to our young, younger people a sense of investment and reward yeah. so that we actually feel part of wider society. Respect and pride are, are two things that are, are, that are missing from so many people of, of many ages in this country. And, you know, we love this country. We want it to be good. We want it to be great. We want it to be uh, all, all it can be and, and all that potential needs to get out there. But there are so many things dragging us back. But there are so many things we can do instead of being reactive. Mm. Um, there are so many proactive measures we can take. But successive governments, I'm afraid, have you know, it's short termism. And when your focus is short termism, they don't, they don't want to put money into prevention. They don't want to put money. They want to. They want to. They want to. They want a quick fix, Judy, don't they? Oh, yeah, and we will be continually within this cycle and we will not break the uh, cycle of deprivation, uh, abuse uh, and our youngsters will turn to county drug, you know, county drug running. They will turn to crime. There is a lack of empathy and compassion and respect and it is growing in all sectors. And uh, even, you know, some of the youngsters who um, work in uh, the service sector, the attitude is absolutely appalling. I know, I know what absolutely. you mean. Judy, I've, I've got to leave it there because we've got some breaking news. But Judy, thanks for your call. I wish I could talk to you for longer. The breaking news is that the UK is to temporarily pause funding in Gaza for the UN Refugee Agency. I think that's a good idea because there is evidence that people with, who work for UNRWA, the uh, Refugee Agency, have been uh, either members of Hamas or supporting Hamas attacks, terrorist attacks on Israel. That's an emerging story. I'm sure Nick Dubois is going to bring you more on that on his show between one and four, but that's the breaking news that the UK has to temporarily pause funding for the UN Refugee Agency, UNRWA, uh, in Gaza. Now, Nick is with me now. Just about a minute or so, Nick, to talk yes, about Yes, I know, not very long, show. so I will be asking, uh, how would you fix Britain's crime problems? I think we had those interesting statistics where James Cleverly, the Home Secretary, suggested actually things aren't as bad as people are saying, and of course the statistics were a little bit Nice crime up 77%, shoplifting up 32%. And we will be looking at that and looking at, oh, you know, what is the solution? My guess is it's a combination of everything that's been proposed, but let not, don't let that stop you calling in with your views. And as a US execute someone with what was a ghastly form of execution, in my opinion, I am asking, would you nevertheless want the death penalty back here in the UK and why? No. 
is uh, the answer. Exactly, it exactly. Doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't stop people killing other people. Exactly. I'm sure others will not share your view as well as share your view, and I would like to explore that. And would you feel safer with US nuclear weapons here? I had a girlfriend once who spent a long time at Greenham Common. There's a little bit of a story about that. I want to hear that, that one. On I'll be tuning in for that one. That's Nick de Bois, who's uh, here between 1 o'clock and 4 o'clock. Uh, I'm very intrigued by what he's <laughs> just said there. I want to thank the top team behind the glass, Chris Jacobs, uh, who's been the producer, uh, Carl Christopher Ansari, who's the assistant producer, Dave Rhodes, Tech Up Dave, of course, the technical operator.